hold our district director, Sean. Sean's <laughs> everywhere in the district. And we have Michael Bowen, who is our current program quality director of District 21. Michael. <laughs> Administ administrative manager. We have a division directors. We have Mike and David to wave. We appreciate your support and being here and all that you do for us as Toastmasters within the divisions and the greater Victoria area. And we have some current area directors with us. And raise your hand. We have Brenna. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> she's my area director, that's how I know her. <laughs> Anyone else that's a current area director? Okay, so we're supposed to have about 25, 30 people here, so a lot of people slept in this morning or had a better, better offer. I don't know what it was, but <laughs> we're not going to take it personally, right? Right. There's a sheet uh, going around, and if you would sign in on it, and you'll see at the top that I written across it where we want your email and your phone number and your credentials. And that's a request from Raymond Ho, who's the chief judge, because of course when you're finished here, they want to put you on the distribution list for all things wise and wonderful, and you'll be top on the list that they call when they're looking for a qualified judge. So uh, if you'd sign in, that would be great. So welcome to the process of looking at judging. Judging is uh, an amazing process, or so they keep telling us. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a time of uh, when all our judgments come out, our anger comes out, our resentment, our loyalties to certain speakers. Have any of you ever been in a speech contest and at the end walked over to your friends or your clubmates and went, oh my God, like who judged that? <laughs> Like, really? Anybody have that experience? Okay, the rest of you have never been at a contest. <laughs> yeah, because I have walked out of contests going, well, the winner didn't place. The person who could have gone on and won international didn't get out of area. I've seen that happen. And that's the responsibility of our judges. And I look around, and I look for the people that are holding the judging sheets, and I'm going, what on God's green earth, excuse my language, were they looking for? Mm -hmm. So we want to look at it, because judging is very different than evaluation. And one of the things that happens often at district is we run around and some of you had this experience or at area, division, district. We run around and look for people to judge contests. And the first person that walks in that's got their eyes completely open, has coffee in their hand, we go, oh, they're functioning. Good, they'll be a great judge. Would you be the judge today? <laughs> or we cast the, the call out to the clubs and say, who's coming to the contest? And that's what you have to do to be qualified to judge a contest. Now, Toastmasters doesn't require people to take training, but it says right in the rule book that you should. Now, uh, should isn't a word that I use, but it's there is some expectation, and there's uh, certainly qualifications in terms of what we've done in Toastmasters. The, ex the assumption that if you're judging that you've done some experience in your club and achieve some level. But it doesn't mean that you know how to judge. We all learn how to evaluate. And this is where the biggest difference happens in Toastmastering, is that people come as evaluators rather than judges. So today we're gonna to walk through a number of things, and I'll just cover uh, Sean's covered most of the housekeeping, but I'll cover it again in maybe 10 or 15 minutes when the rest of the people uh, arrive. And uh, so we're going to spend some time today. We're going to actually look at all four five contests. Do you know that how many contests 
does Toastmasters actually have in total that we run? Computers. In total. Lots. Plus it's different six. languages. <laughs> well, no, not counting that we'll have the international. International is always only done in English, yes. so you know that. But humor can be done in other languages, so not counting different languages. But. So let's look at what contest we have. We, tall tales. we have tall tales, Humor's humor, evaluation. table topics, evaluation, international, international, and video tape. And video. So six. Yeah. So we have six in total that happen <laughs> worldwide. So where where are the video? What's that about? What's the video contest? Never heard of it. So <laughs> Semi finals for the rules. Oh. I, actually, it's not. Actually, the vid, but there's video involved in that now, uh, starting this year. But the video contests are where they take contests from countries. That actually send them in. So there's countries not assigned to regions that can submit uh, recorded. So it only shows at the international level they announce the winners. Yes. I was wondering, do they have to be from outside a district? Because I think last year there was a couple people that placed from Alaska or something, which is District 32. Yeah, I don't know all the details of that. I went looking and I couldn't. I didn't find it all, but there's a yeah, there's some process to submit. I don't think it's that I could go or you could go and compete in that recorded contest. So I think there's some other no access to the district contest somehow. There's some loophole there. Yeah. Unless you want to squeeze through a loophole. <laughs> so there's six contests. But five, you may be called upon to judge. Right. So the five. And, uh, okay. So we're going to look at the five contests. We'll look at them and the criteria of discussion about them. And then towards about the last hour of our time together, we're going to have a contest. And you're going to actually get to practice being a judge so that you can use your newfound, you gained information and see how it changes your experience from the last time you may have judged. So how many people here have judged in a contest before? Okay, so most of you, three, four, haven't. Um, how many of you have competed in a contest? Okay, again, the same number. What I know is when you're competing in a contest, you need to know how the judges work. This is one of the most valuable places that a contestant can spend their time, is understanding how does the judging function and what do they need to know. So you can share that with your club contestants. So we're gonna spend time doing that and then have a contest and uh, look at I also want to provide a lot of time for your questions as we go through. So does anybody not bring a device or you're lost? Cool. Good, good. Okay, it worked. <laughs> so why me and why would I want to talk about contests? Well, I've been last year at the International, um, where were we? In Chicago. <laughs> what place was I? Uh, at, in Chicago at the International Convention at the World Champion of Public Speaking, I was the chief judge. So I've been chief judge a number of times at the World Championship. I've also been the tie-breaking judge at the World Champion of Public Speaking. And I've also been a judge. And what I love about being the chief judge of the World Championship is you get to talk and do the briefing for the judges that are going to pick the world winner. And I told them last year, look, if men have had their run, this year we're picking all women. For <laughs> 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 the first time in my life, they listened to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was interesting. Uh, as as the chief judge to be in the room as we counted the ballots to see the winners start to emerge and go, oh my goodness, this is 
a moment in Toastmasters history for the first time, that not only in first place, but in second place, but also in third place. And it's certainly not a gender contest, but it's interesting to see the movement for more and more women to get into competition, because we've had many discussions of why can't women win the world championship? And I say, well, what is the bias? Are there systemic barriers? Are, are there systemic biases? Just stop and think just the voice of a woman when she gets on a stage and she's mic'd versus this sexy voice down here of some man <laughs> can sound much more powerful than somebody that's up here. So there can be an unconscious bias. It's just, it's just curious <coughs> to look at it from all angles when you're a judge. Do you have a bias when it comes to voice? Do you have um, the bias of topics that are talked about? Do you really think down deep down that men are the best speakers in contests? It's usually not at the <laughs> breakfast table. <laughs> <laughs> so it's yes, David. Yeah, do you have a great deal of how many women have won through the course of the history? A very, very few. Um, three, three that I know have won the world championship. Uh, so we have Rosabella, who's up in Division G, no G. C. Uh, what is it? C. 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 Arabella changed it since. Uh, yeah. Arabella, uh, Bankston, Ron, Ron, Bankston, Bankston. Bankston. Okay, so she's up there in C, up in the Nanaimo area. And so she won back in the 80s, 86, 86, before I was, yeah, after I was in Postmaster. So she won, and then um, helped me with a woman, Lashanda, 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 Lashanda Rundle. What won in Calgary in yeah. when we were in Calgary? She won, and she since died because she had lupus. And um, and now we've got Ramona, yeah. So those are the only three women I know, yeah. There may have been some earlier, but uh, yeah, well, women haven't been around that long in those masters, so 74. So it's Something to think about when, you know, as judges, those are the things that we get to challenge is our personal biases and being aware of what they are. Okay, so let's look at, just spend a few minutes of what your expectations are for today. So what do you hope to get out of today? Anything specific? Not really. <laughs> we can have bananas and oranges and a break. <laughs> yes, Jen. I'm interested to see at the district level how how we are going to pull off the videotaping aspect. Okay, I'll have you meet with Sean after. He's the district director, and uh, and it actually says that the program quality person is supposed to organize that. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I it's his responsibility. Yes, yeah, Brenna. When we were at the division, whatever the training was, <laughs> district like office. Our, training. Yeah, our office training. Uh, they talked about a a judge debriefing, and I believe it was something you had talked about. So yeah. then I signed up for this. Was because. I was very curious to learn more about that. I've never yes. heard of that before. This is, uh, we will do this today. We're going to demonstrate it because I experienced this when I went to Australia. And I was at the district, and I went to their judges training, which is why I brought this judges training back. And we did judges debriefing after all their contests. So it happens when, after the contest is completed, and the ballots are collected, and all the judges and the counters and the timers and chief judge all leave the room in mass. And the there is an experienced toastmaster who's in charge of that, who doesn't have an official role except the debriefer facilitator, and they meet with the judges. 
while the ballot counters and chief judge are counting the results for the contest. And they actually talk about how they voted and what impressed them. So it's an ongoing education process and awareness. And I learned a huge amount by attending those debriefings. So we're going to do that today and uh, have an experience of that. And you can look at it if you want to do it in your area or division or district. It happens, and I check with TI, and they're okay with it. <laughs> in case you're worried that we're breaking rules again. Yes. What else? Expectations? Yes. I like to really understand how to rate an individual for certain categories. I find that when I'm reading what I, how I need to rate someone, and I'm paying a lot of attention to the speaker, how do I accurately measure that? Okay, cool. Anybody else have that in their head? <laughs> yeah. Steve? Just a segue to that same issue is how do you rate the very first? Right, because exactly. Because that always gives the problem because that sets the standard. Yeah. And how do you get rid of your personal bias? Mm -hmm. your personal bias? Sure. Yeah. This is great because obviously this workshop doesn't have a set script, so these help me understand what you want to cover. You touched on it earlier, the, the differences between evaluation versus mm -hmm. judging, because I really want to hear sort of how that plays out. Okay. Yes. How to do a really solid judge's briefing. Um, my pet peeve, I can put a star here. Chief judge briefing. I think this is why I get asked to be chief judge at International, because World Headquarters knows how I do my briefing, and judges walk out and say, I've never been briefed like that before. Yeah. And I go, you're international officers, what do you mean you've never been briefed like that before? Yeah, and also, although I've read the rule books, what's the differences from past years to now? Uh huh. Updates. The nuances can be great for the content, right? Yeah. This, I just do this because it satisfies the teacher in me. I really need this. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes. The other thing is, uh, when you have a judge that's new, what are the sorts of things, the do's and don'ts for them, the, ten, the things that uh, novice judges might do incorrectly, or approaches that they you know, probably shouldn't be doing? Okay, cool. If anything else comes up, we can um, do that. Go to it. Let's have a look quickly at who's in our group. So, I want to start and just introduce yourself. And has everybody got the sign in sheet? Has that made its way around? No, I don't. Okay, so it's from that side. It was me, Cassie. Where's the pin? <laughs> okay, so let's start at the let's start at the front here and introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm interested in knowing what level you've judged at, if you've judged at all. So and maybe tell us what club you're in or area or division, something like that, if you know what it is. Karen Hall, Sue Carver Toastmasters. Um, and I've only judged at the club level. Okay. I'd like to get a better understanding to move further up. Yeah, cool, great. Welcome, Karen. Sean, got you. <laughs> Sean, district director. What kind of judging have you done? I have judged uh, international semifinals. Okay. Up so. to international semifinals. Yeah, cool. Great. It's fun, right? It, it is. And if you think club or district is tough, it's interesting to sit at international and the best is there. 
And you've got to decide who wins. Yeah. Ian. Uh, I belong both to Master Motivators and West Coast Toastmasters, and I judge this film horrible. Okay, good. Okay. They're the hardest when you're back with friends. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Brenna Robinson, Canada Revenue and Rapporteurs. Uh, I've judged uh, club, area, and divisions. I think I've judged around 15 to 20 contests in the past two years. Cool. So, Mike? Mike Zoll, Division A Director from, originally from Night Shifters, but now I'm with Master Motivators. I've judged on all levels, including area, Clubs, areas, and, and districts. Okay, cool. Great. Hi, Janet Ireland from Norvik and Master Motivators. I have judged at club, area, division, district, and international semi final in the fall. And I have served as District 21 Chief Judge in 20 something. <laughs> I, I understand that. I understand that comment. <laughs> Mike, what's your, Michael, what's your experience? Uh, club 507, 6070, very diversity. Or are you remembering that club number? I have judged up to the international city finals. So you'll, so you'll realize that the district officers get recruited to vote or to judge at semifinals because every semifinal needs a minimum of nine judges at it and we had ten contests last year. You're basically looking for ninety qualified judges just to show up for minimum. Yeah. Without the international finals. So, great, thanks. Uh, and that's with uh Victoria Delisti, area two, division A. And I have not been a judge at any level yet. I was asked to be a judge at the last year convention in Chicago <laughs> by the chief judge. He came up to me, can you, have you ever judged? I, I, oh, he didn't ask me that actually. Can you be a judge? I said, I, I cannot because I'm not qualified. I'll never judge any <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great, thanks. And John Young from a club survey at First Canadian, and I have been judged as a club level and uh, area. Oh, no, uh, yeah, area. Uh, we are area too. Cool. I'm April Atkins, and I'm from Club 38 with John in First Canadian. I've been a club judge, and then I was asked once to be a division judge. And I couldn't understand why the one was selected. That is why I'm here today. All about the rules. All about the rules. Before I uh, go on, I, I would like to add one to that. Yeah. I would like to know like, the vetting process in there. And that would. I think that's really important. The what process? Oh, the vetting of it. Making sure that they're qualified oh. at, that, at, at different levels, right? Okay. So I'm Pauline Cohen. I'm the Jason Bates Toastmaster. And uh, I have basically um, been a, a judge in most of the contests that have been here in Victoria. And I think once at a district meeting. Yeah. Okay, great. David Ojla, Division B Director, OK Toastmasters, Master Motivators, and hopefully you get elocution races. I've been at the club area and division for judging. Great. I'm Uma, and I'm from Rising Toastmaster Club, and I've judged at clubs at the Asian Division, but none of them have been in China. Mm -hmm. Okay, in what country? I'm from India. India? Okay, great. So, just very close. I need to. Great. Welcome. And whereabouts in India are you? In Bangalore. Hmm? Bangalore. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Adrian Walton, I'm also with Rise and Shine, and I've never been a judge, so we have a contest coming up in our club. And I thought it would be a good idea to learn about the judgery prior to the contest, even though we don't have a contest chair as we ask all the judges if they <laughs> get to know that when they looking for judges that I would uh, just be qualified to be a judge. Hey. Haven't yet. I'm hard to your little I'm well, I'm in, I'm in Master Motivators at, at my sort of main club and a couple other clubs, but I've been a judge over the years up to when we had region, region, whatever. Okay. Cool. Great. Thanks, Art. My name is Louisa Davis. I'm actually from District 96. And my club is The Amazing Toastmasters, which is the corporate club for Best Buy Canada, which is where I work. And I'm also in Speak Your Mind Toastmasters, formerly for Living Group Speaking, Angela Louis Club, and we are an events club. I have judged at the club area and division levels. I've also judged at a club and area level in Switzerland. And I've been a world championship of of debating internet or an international judge for them in the 1980s, 1990s. So long ago. Do you have any uh, district oh. roles? And I'm the uh, the program quality director. I just stepped into my role in November, so it's a little bit like drinking the water from a fire hose. Here to learn. Great. Well, welcome, Louisa. Thanks for coming over to see us. <laughs> Not all the way from India, but Vancouver. <laughs> yeah. And my name is Emelina. I'm the KFA Postmasters, and I'm assistant director to the Convention Committee. And I have not had any experience with the point of schedule, but I look forward to learning. Okay. Great. So, as you can see, thank you everyone for sharing lots of experience judging at various levels. And so that's fantastic. Let's spend some time looking at what do you think the differences are between judging and evaluation? Evaluation we do every week. We're so trained. It's so automatic. We do it all the time. Even when we're walking down the street, we're always evaluating. I call it judging, but it's actually evaluating. We go, oh, that person should wear brown shoes with that suit. <laughs> You're trying to help us. Help a speaker when you're evaluating, you're trying to help them improve. Whereas judging, you have a set criteria that you need to assess how they did okay. rather than help them improve. Yeah, great. What else? Judging doesn't provide feedback. Absolutely. That's, that's the ideal. Judges really have a hard time after not telling people what they think and sharing, but you're not. Says in the rule book not to do that. No. That's why some people said something about the judge should read them. Because, yeah. yeah. What else? What's the difference? Yes. Please. It seems to me when you're judging, you're doing it alone. Because often in evaluating, you're sharing your opinion with other people. Sometimes there's a panel evaluation for the other evaluators who have some judges' comments. So it's more of a private exercise than a public one. Yeah, okay. What else might be the differences between evaluation and judging? Uh, uh, I think, yeah, Jan. You give a numeric score on judging, so you have to translate your thoughts into math. Yeah. In judging, you're looking at specific criteria, whereas an evaluation can be much broader or much narrower depending upon your relationship with the speaker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. What else? And I think judging is more. 
you compare this person with, uh, with others. But evaluation is more focused on how the speaker's past experience and how the speaker has built on. So it's the growth, it's the learning from the speaker rather than the comparison with other people. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You're trying to choose a winner versus giving them help. Yeah. Anything else? Chris, I think you've covered them. So we're basically looking at uh, at the parameters. So in judging, it's strictly laid out what you're looking at. Very documented in the in the contest format, there's all the things that you're looking at. And there's basically, um, the contestant doesn't come over and say, I want you to look at this. And it's everything according to the criteria set out. Where in evaluation, if you can use the criteria in the manual or in the path, but it, or the project, but it's also looking at, um, I might say I really want you to focus on my body language or my vocal variety or whatever, so you can customize it and get feedback. But this is a critical perspective that we often forget in judging, is that your role as a judge is to pick the winner. And that's, there's even a subtle difference between pick the winner versus add up your scores and believe what you wrote because in the last hour and a half of hearing 10 speeches, the, this person you scored more. Don't ever get to the end of the contest, add up your numbers and write them down blindly without going back and saying, is that really the winner of this contest? Because if you started judging, a number one speaker still blows your mind when you heard number 10, you need to really go back and say, who won this contest? Because number one, you may have scored low to a, uh, provide lots of space for the other speakers, and as you listen, you get tired, and you're not listening as sharply, and you maybe start to actually erode your numbers. So just be careful and that at the end you ask yourself, is this person really the winner? As a person in the audience, to pick the winner. And of course, evaluation is always about encouragement, supportive, feedback to help someone get better at whatever they're doing. What about reactions in terms of judging? We talked a bit about this. Sorry, I don't understand the question. Okay, okay. Um, thanks, Mike. Thank you. Um, in terms of, I guess I'm looking at what is done after the fact, and, it, and reaction may be not an easy word to understand in terms of what I was looking for. Uh, just looking at the fact that um, <laughs> evaluation is the criteria in a manual, and we have discussions about it after. We can talk about the pros and cons, and somebody will say, well, I don't agree with you, and we have a discussion. Okay, what would make sense? How could you do that? Where in judging, it doesn't happen. You scored a piece of paper, you can it in, you walk away with your with your uh, document and, and you get rid of it, right? So it, it's not up for discussion. You don't stand around with other judges necessarily and show your document either. Right? So that's not that's the difference. And you don't necessarily focus on what wasn't achieved when you're judging focusing on how well did they do what they did. Because if you're focusing on what didn't they do and how could they do it, you've lost your contestant. If you're, if you're going down that road in your evaluation mindset, you're going to get behind in the judging. So you have to really get disciplined and I'm just listening to what's happening here and get that uh, myopic viewpoint and, and ears tuned in. And then justification. Judges don't get to talk about after and do not want to talk about and must not talk about what happened, where you placed it, stand around and go, oh, I don't know how so-and-so won, like I never placed them. <laughs> yeah. 
And I, I, I did a faux pas one year, and I say it out front, just for learning purposes. I actually said to somebody, because I was the tiebreaker judge and the world champion of public speaking, and the person that won the contest was number 10 on my tiebreaker machine. That was the worst speech I had ever heard. And they won the world champion of public speaking. Did I want to tell everybody? You bet I did. <laughs> I was so angry. I was. I said, what an insult to Toastmaster to put that out in the world and say, this is the best we've got. And I'm going, are you kidding me? I wouldn't ask them to speak at my family reunion. Or even with people I didn't know. Excuse me, can I interrupt? You just said something I think that's really important. And oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Molly. <laughs> I, think, I think that's something that we should really take into consideration when we judge every speech. And that is that the best speaker representing his children? Yeah. So whether it be a club contest or whatever, I really, really like that particular Thank you, and, and it's one of the things that I say over here in judges' briefing. It's one of the things that I always say when we're finished the briefing. I said, your role is to choose the best speaker to represent us out in the world and the program that we deliver. Is that person representing us and what we teach and our program? Because there's been some world champions out there that I don't think represent Toastmasters. I think somebody, I think there's a difference between bad acting and good speaking. And I think that the pendulum <laughs> is my personal opinion. I think the pendulum swings sometimes, and that there's this um, tendency to get impressed with acting. And I go, but where's the speaking? Because this is the world champion of public speaking, not bad acting. So I think there's a, a balance, and I think that that's one of the things that we, as judges, need to consider. How much acting? You know, Toastmasters say, oh, we need more gestures. Well, and I go, and we need to be authentic. If you get up and you go, yes, and I dusted myself off, and I picked myself up, and then I walked off, and I go, <laughs> <laughs> like, could you just stand and tell me the story again? Like, what bad acting? So it goes to extremes because we say, oh, you should do gestures. Well, gestures have to be purposeful. They have to be meaningful. Even in our club, when we hear icebreakers and people start pacing, we say, could you stop pacing? Could you just stand, relax, let your hands hang by your side? Sometimes this is the place to be, to deliver your speech. It doesn't have to be, hi everybody, welcome to my world. <laughs> Our big world. Can you take that one, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> and if you've ever, oh, the stories, right? I watch. The, well, and body language, right? You say, well, look at this when we look at the criteria. I watch people at international, and they're here, and they're, and then we do the holographic, right? So this is your past, and then this is your present, and then this is your future, which at some level makes sense. When you're on a huge stage, like these people are on stages that are humongous, right? So you got lots of space, and you got a few thousand people out there. But I've seen people over here telling their story, which is their past, and suddenly, they forgot to move, and they go striding and talking <laughs> to get over here because they're in the future. Yeah. And, and I'm going, mm -hmm. where are we in your life? Like, if you had a breakdown between there and here. <laughs> so, so it's just, as a judge, it's looking at what happens in the judging form when you see something like that, when something's super inauthentic. What do you do with that? Yes. Um, at any event that judges should not give speak about their judging, I would say in every level, so people 
people are very generous to help me get better. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they told me was, it had to come down to who's going to get the second place, and you didn't use the whole stage. That is your platform, so you have to be using the whole stage. And I was like, oh, really? And then the other thing they said was that the first two speakers were their personal stories. Mine was of another person. So in inspirational Toastmaster uh, content, Toastmaster content, they like personal stories. And I was like, okay. So there is a formula to this. Just spit up. The Actually, formula. there's not a formula. I write down the formula and I go for formula. No. Please don't. <laughs> and I'm always interested when people come up and say, well, this is what you should do. And I always go, yeah, who appointed you? <laughs> <laughs> who are you? Have you won the world championship? Because who are they to tell you that that's what you should do? Maybe they're behind time and you're ahead of time in terms of what should happen. Or maybe you're just in the right time and it's your way of doing it. I don't know. I don't like formula speeches, and I've seen, this is my bias as a judge, and I challenge myself with this bias, but I've seen people at area and division levels, just locally, that have gone to um, uh, Patricia Fripp, Pat, Patricia and the Chance, Pat, or Fripp and the Chance, whatever she Lady and the Chance. Lady and the Chance. Lady and the Chance. And they come back, and as soon as they start speaking, I know they, they're a graduate of Lady and the Chance. I know the way they open, I know how they've constructed, and I know how they move, and I go, I hate this. This is so inauthentic. There is no connection to the audience. It's all about you. And I want, as a speaker, I believe that connection to the audience is what's important. Yeah. I was going to say, my aunt, is, uh, she's actually a director here at UVEC. Um, and she did a job interview, and she said to me, I know this one guy that he was, he clearly must have been in Toastmasters, just by how robotic he was in his, and she was very, very, so it happens even in job interviews. But as far as feedback, I had before suggested to a contestant, just that as a tip, when you move on to the districts in your evaluation contest, you must include a conclusion. <laughs> because I still, you know, how do you win with me? I don't get it. Yeah. But you, but the person did win, but they did not give a conclusion. And they, if you're going to carry on, you have to give that conclusion in your evaluation. <laughs> yeah, and it's one thing if it's written on the evaluation for, or on the judging form, and you're saying, you know, I might want to have a look at the last category of the judging criteria because you didn't get any marks there. I wouldn't do that if I was the judge, but if I was their friend or if I was the person in their club, I'd go, you need to go back and look at the criteria. Because if you're competing, why would we, it's like going to study to become a doctor and go, I'm not studying any medical stuff. I just need a C to get a degree. Yeah. <laughs> like, like study what they're going to judge you on. It just makes sense if you're competing. If you just want to do it your way, that's fine, but don't be concerned if you don't win or, or don't place. Okay, Mike. I have a question, but this may be, may not be, I don't know how to say this. Well, I just. Well, just I ask it anyway. <laughs> Forget the free qualifier. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say, let's go back to the point. I think that's very important. You, you said that what, no matter what level it is, our winners need to represent what we learn and what we teach in Toastmasters. And let's say if you see it, let's say if you're judging a speaker on the world stage, and that speaker is phenomenal, you know, phenomenal. But at the same time, you know that person in real life, he or she is not acting with integrity, let's say. Then how do you go about that? So you are not judging a person based on the speaking quality, but at the same time, you know if that person gets picked as the as a world champion, then that person does not reflect our um, value, right? The top mm -hmm. one value. So, what, what, what is your thought? Well, I, I guess 
for me, first of all, would I know who they were? Most cases in speech contests, you don't know the people individually. Uh, so you don't have that advantage. <coughs> for me, it's the connection and the authenticity that they bring to what they're doing. So if, they, if it's all planned, like the person uh, lost points in a number of different categories, and we'll look at that when they realized that they were in the wrong part of the stage and went over like this very purposely to get to the right, the right place, lost points in a lot of categories for me because it lost connection. I lost connection with their, you know, it, just a lot of things happen. And we'll look at that when we look at the judging form specifically of what happens. Because it's not just, oh, I'm taking five points off. You can't do that. You have to according to the criteria. And what did it impact? Didn't impact the content, right? So did it impact the delivery? Absolutely. For me, it impacted the delivery. So it was in that category of delivery that the scoring got impacted. So you can't bleed the parts into the other parts. Same as if you don't like a topic, you don't get to say as the judge how they present the topic. That's why uh, contestants can speak on what they want. It's not a prescribed topic. Okay, let's look at Eligibility, first of all, what do you need to do to be eligible uh, for a contest judge? And this is on page seven of the speech contest rule book. Now, the rule book is revised every single year. Okay, so did you print out the new rule book or you got access to it? And my rule book, the first thing I do is I go and I just show you what I've done. You see these blue flags? Those are on the pages that there's changes this year. Mm. Because they mark them. Toastmasters has done this for many years, so they mark. And if you look at page um, number five of the speech contest rules for this year, on the left-hand corner beside B, Number 1B, you'll notice that there's a dark diamond. Mm -hmm. Those are all the current updates for this year. So you can, if you know the rule book by heart from last year, you can flip through this year and go, oh, I just need to change my knowledge of page 5, page 7, page 8, page 9, page 12. So you only have to memorize this for learn. A few little paragraphs if you already know the rule book by heart. This is the most valuable reading that you can do as a judge or as a chief judge or as a district officer. And if you sit and you're frustrated as a speech observer at a contest, read the rule book. It's not really that dry. It sounds like it, but if we said an adventure into speaking, we might all read it, right? But, uh, you know, I was reading it last week, and it, it's actually it's actually very interesting, because there's a lot of things in here that answer questions that we wouldn't, um, we might have questions about and not know. Okay, so let's look at the, um, Qualifications. So different qualifications at different levels. Eligibility. Yes. What page is that? It's uh, page seven of the rule book. Uh, selections and things. But before that, is it, that's contested eligibility. Page six. Page yeah. seven. Page seven. Six. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Number six is for contestants. Page six. Well, six is for. Um, eligibility uh, is right. contestants. So we're talking only eligibility for s judges. Okay. Oh, they're down yeah. to be. Oh, okay. Yep. Section There's B. There's no bolding. <laughs> yeah. It's a problem. Yeah, it just talks about eligibility. Yeah. Below eight. So at. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So it's on page seven and it's number B. <laughs> right? And 
Yes. Okay. So let's look. <laughs> I've written it out in a different way. So I'm not that. So <laughs> what did what ha, what do you need to do to be a judge? How do how do you need to be eligible? Let's use this document so we have um, access to it because it's your resource when you leave here. Paid member. Have to be a paid member for a minimum of six months for area. Okay. Is there any, um, is like if there was a new club that formed, is there any exception for that? Not for judges. For no. contestants, there are, but not for judges. Yes, Jen. I wonder why it doesn't say be a paid member of a club in good standing. It does say that somewhere else. It says that your club has to be somewhere else. Yeah. So you have to be a paid member of a, a club in good standing. So your club has to have its dues paid. Okay. Uh, what else do you have to have? It's interesting that you have to be president of the club that's to your survey. Yeah, you actually do. Because, see, we have so many virtual clubs. So you have to be physically present. So the world of virtual clubs now has Seriously, changed that. That is interesting. So oh. virtual, they're going to have to focus on them. They can't judge. They have no. They have to be physically present. Yeah. But yeah. that would be for an area or a, a division, right? Like at a club level, you don't even have to have a contest. You can just say, hey, this is going to who's going to represent our club. So it's just for the area division. Yeah. Yeah, area, division, district. What what else? Uh, completed six, <coughs> excuse me, six CC speeches or two levels of pathways. Yes. So that's that's an addition this year because of pathways or probably last year it was in there. But there's also an equivalency <laughs> now for pathways. Uh, and then It talks about that judges at all levels. Oh, yes. Uh, when you say a paid member for a minimum of six months, should it be continuous six months or is it not going to be um, Actually, because people pay a minimum of six months for, for membership, it would be, you have to be a member for six months. So if you were, if it was a break, maybe. Yeah, so. I'm not sure that I would want somebody that was less than that at my area or division or district judging. I don't know how much experience have they got, what do they know? I mean, they could bring lots of knowledge, but relevant to the contest, so yeah, but exposure. But that's a criteria, so you could need it, you'd have to prove it. Yeah. And then you also have to sign a judge's certificate of eligibility and code of ethics. Okay, so you have to sign sign that. So, so at the yes, Mike. So a, so attending the judges training is not the requirement. No, it's not. And even people that say who who might judge on the district level, they may not have prior judging experience before. They have um. Because it doesn't say that to serve as a you know, judge yeah. at the district level, you know, people must have prior judging experience, <coughs> division or area or top level, it doesn't say there. At international, it talks about that, but it doesn't at the early first stages. But think, if Sean's or Michael's looking for judges, you think he wants people that have, first of all, wants training, or have, have looked at the forum before, or have judged somewhere before, because it's not evaluation, right? Which is the paradigm shift for all of us. And that's that's where I spent this time is looking at it and getting out of the evaluation mindset. Right? To to go in you're comparing person one, two, three, four, five on content and delivery. Whatever it is. So at the division and district contest, judges are selected from the clubs not represented in that uh, by a contestant. Okay, so those of you that are 
division or district contest, you really are looking for people that don't have a contestant. So sometimes that proves difficulty at those levels because those are the clubs that show up. And then you're phoning around. Now at the club level, you can use people in your club, but some clubs really like to ask and exchange and say, I'm going to phone Obey and see if they'll send us four, four judges and we'll send four over to them so that we can have more of a, an objective judging process, right? So you can form alliances with clubs and have partnerships in terms of exchanging judges. It's pretty nice. Um, this is this is one of the, the downfalls uh, that I've seen when clubs don't get outside judges. So I had I was uh, mentoring somebody and they were working on a contest speech. And their, their speech was progressively getting better, and they've done it twice in our club already. And I said, this is an excellent contest speech. And so they went into the contest, and people in the club heard that speech for the third time. It wasn't nearly as exciting as the one they heard for the first time. Mm -hmm. And it was by far the best speech but it didn't win because we'd already heard it. This was the third time and I said, oh. Right. So that's the disadvantage when you come to club and you have club members a judge because we've been evaluating. We've all been evaluating, we've all been sending notes, we've all been thinking, oh, that was, um, you know, demonstrate whatever it was, um, show what you mean, that was a great speech for that, and then we saw it under um, motivate or inspire your audience, and that was a great speech there, and now it's reworked and it's on a judging criteria, and we're still in evaluation mode. Or we're hearkening back to when it was a better version of what did inspire your audience way better. Yeah. Also, if you know the speaker you've heard from before, sometimes you have a bias against well, what they could have done and mm -hmm. what you've seen in the past, yeah. You have to be judging them based on the here and now of this particular speech. And it's hard to, to let that go sometimes. Yeah, and I think that I think that the evaluation and the judging transition at a club level is most challenging because we're so used to sitting in that chair. At least if I walk into Oak Bay and I walk in and I'm the judge, I don't sit there every week evaluating. I haven't evaluated these speakers. I haven't given them feedback on how that speech would be better as a contest speech, and now hearing it delivered. Yeah. When you're a judge and you feel that you could be biased towards a speaker, can you not calculate? You can. You have to calculate. Yeah. Well, you don't judge <laughs> any of them, <laughs> right? Yeah, like you can. Right. You can't just not judge one contestant. Yeah, yeah they're all or none. Out because. When we score them, we score every judge's evaluation, so you've already disadvantaged them as not getting any marks from you, which affects the placing. True. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. yeah, you have to score them, and you have to really discipline yourself, and it's one of those challenges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So think about your club and how you want the judges to be in your club, because we're all approaching club contests rapidly, right? So you might want to phone up another club and exchange judges. The same thing uh, in, in terms of areas. It's nice if you can go outside the area. And division, I mean, we have a, we are fortunate that we have divisions that are close by and can we swap some judges around. But again, it's really important to make sure that those where the contestants are from are not where the judges are coming from. And in the uh, area contest. Yep. And it was about uh, traveling and being on a plane, and, and I did a bit of theatrics of running up the ramp with a suitcase uh -huh. <laughs> to start the speech. But I had never, I had never ascertained what the speaking area was. Would that that wouldn't uh, disqualify me, would it, or would that just take points away? Um, it, well, if you were never told, it, chances are the judges were never told either. It's one of the most frequently omitted details in the contest. Yeah. 
So if it wasn't designated, there shouldn't be any points taken off. The judges wouldn't be taking points off. You wouldn't be. But if it was designated, that's just points taken off. That's not a disqualifying no. factor. Thanks. Yeah. So we'll look at the, yeah, disqualifications are only on eligibility, and you're, of course, you're disqualified if you're over or under time. Yeah, yeah. But eligibility. Yeah, yeah, so I want to make a comment on that because that's a, yeah. a good point here. If uh, if during the district contest you went outside the speaking area, you would not be on the video, and the uh, the ability to move on to the quarter through the quarterfinals <coughs> is based on the video. So if you go outside the speaking area, you're probably going outside the video, and you would not be seen. Your chances of moving forward then at beyond the quarterfinals would be severely restricted. So it would be it would be it would hamper the district on being able to send someone to the international. Yeah. So it's you know the world changes. So now that we're videoing for the quarterfinals at the district level, it's it creates a designated speaking area based on because they can't zoom and they can't move the camera. It's set up. So here's the speaking area, and that'll that'll actually govern what the designated speaking area is in the future. Yeah. Because all they're doing in that is reviewing the videos that they see. I hear a rule change coming on. Well, <laughs> because they, they it's only three, three points on their form, but it, now it could be a disqualification. Well, it, <laughs> it speaks to being inside the designated speaking area, right? So I don't know what they'll do with that. Yeah. We Let's not try and guess what the board will do with that. <laughs> well, I would make a motion if I had. <laughs> <laughs> I could make that motion because it's not fair. Like it, if their if their judging criteria doesn't match that, then you know you can only lose three points. But yet everything else was amazing. So you're getting ninety seven percent out of a hundred, but yet you weren't on the video part. Like so, how can you then be disqualified? Like it well, just doesn't make like the two. So I can see why. It's you know, the rule change should happen. <laughs> okay, so let's look at, so that's what you need to be, um, basically in terms of eligible to be a contest judge, and that your rule basically, or your role is to select first, second, and third speaker as a voting judge. So there's all kinds of judges, but as a voting judge, okay. Now tiebreaker judge, what's the tiebreaker judge's purpose? Listening skills are working. Okay. And, and what are some of the things that they do? What what does a tiebreaker judge do in terms of their work? Same same thing that any other judge does, with the exception of they have to put down they have to rate every speaker. Yeah. They rate their role is to rate every speaker in the contest one to ten or however many speakers there were. And then the result can see what they were. Yes. And given directly to the chief judge. You don't hand it in to the counters that are picking it up, anything that goes directly to the chief judge. And that envelope never gets opened unless there's a tie. So there used to be this weird, wonky thing that happened in Toastmasters that I experienced for a number of years, where they would look at and they'd say, oh, there's a tie between second and third place. And they'd rip open the tiebreakers um, in, when, in the counting room, okay? They'd rip open the tiebreakers judge um, ballot, and they would take all their placings and add all those numbers to the current mm contest uh, uh, to the speakers. That's not what you do with the tiebreaker form. Mm -hmm. The tiebreaker judge only breaks the tie. So in this case, second and third place is a tie. You look over on the tiebreaker's judge and you look at those two names. And if the person over here that's tied in second place, uh, the first person that's in second place, tied in third, is number five on their ballot, and the next and the other person is number ten on their ballot. You put the person that was at fifth place on the tiebreakers into second place, and the tenth person goes on to the third place. It doesn't change anything else or anyone else. 
That used to be really wonky because they flipped the whole contest seat. Mm -hmm. And and we used to have discussions in the counting room about this going, no, you don't do that. Oh yes, you have to do that. No. No, it only breaks the existing ties. If there's no ties on that actual final counting ballot tally sheet, you don't open up the tiebreakers. Yes. What if the tiebreaker judge doesn't sign the ballot? You chop their head off. <laughs> 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 the chief judge must ensure that they all sign the ballot very first thing before they even rank the judges. So but it's, but it's a sealed judge, envelope. The so the chief judge often um, has conversation with the, the tiebreaker judge ahead of time, separately, one-on-one, -on -one, because the chief judge does not attend the judge's briefing. <coughs> yes, the tiebreaker, yes, yeah. thank you. The tie-breaking judge does not attend the judge's briefing. All the other judges must attend, but the tiebreaker judge does not. And because as a chief judge you want to collect that into your own hand and nobody else gets it, you want to know where they're sitting. Story, last year my chief judge moved during the contest at the World Champion Public Speaking. And I'm the chief judge and there's a about, I don't know, 3,000 people in the audience, something like that. And I'm running around looking for one face. And I'm going, he's not where he was. And I'm literally walking and looking face to face, row to row, and 3,000 people. And he's gone somewhere else. And I finally went to World Headquarters Stop because everybody in the audience is waiting for us to leave. And I finally went to World Headquarters staff and said, have you seen my chief judge? And they went, or my tiebreaker judge, and they went, oh, he had to move because they're scoring 10 world champion level speakers. They're not finished in two minutes. But of course, sitting in the audience, everybody's looking over their shoulders. So they had to laugh to sit someplace <coughs> else, and I couldn't find them. Eventually, World Headquarters went and got them. I got it. It was funny because we had a lot of laughs later. Yeah. Oh, sorry, question. What's the criteria or what's the motivation or the reasoning why the tiebreaker judge is held separately from everyone? Um, I, I, I don't know. What would we imagine? What would be the reason to not have a tiebreaker um, judge meet with all the other judges? No, I, know. I, think, I think the fundamental concept of what the role is is that the idea is, is to break the tie and not affect the contest. So consequently, you don't want them, their score to be incorporated into the contest. So they're, they're, they're delegated off to the side and they're only utilized in the event of where you sort of like break glass. <laughs> okay. Sean? Well, the anonymity. And because if you ever heard that there was a tie, you would know exactly <laughs> who, made the, who yeah. made the decision. It's not like it's an anonymous and it, because you're adding up a bunch of scores and not one single person necessarily has it affects not one single judge affects a winner, but a tie-breaking judge does affect the winner. Yeah. yeah. No. But that's interesting. I've never heard that before. And I've been a tie-breaker judge. And I've been in the judge briefing. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so again, read the rule book. Because it's all in there. And it says you will not be there. And so you need to, if you're the contest chair, if you're the chief judge, you need to talk to all your people ahead of time. So chief judge... If you're going to be chief judge in your area or your division or area at the district, make sure that you talk to your uh, your tiebreaker judge ahead of time. Make sure they have the documents so they've got that tucked away, and and that they can find a place where they're they can leave the room because they've got they might have ten. I don't know how many do we have now in the district that compete. How many divisions have eight. we got? Eight. eight. So you think about eight speaker. What if you've got three or four of those that are really close and you're sitting in your own room? They need to sit someplace as a tiebreaker where they're anonymous, or anonymous, and that they can leave easily because they might walk up at the counters and the chief judge mm -hmm. and, and just finish their ballot later. Because two minutes isn't enough time. Yeah. Yes. I know two examples that happen since the Tiebreaker's envelope is not open unless. Yeah. So this person was a tiebreaker from this group. And I'm not saying 
drug and every class. So they ran in to go and meet the author, and the people who were doing it told the person, oh, we've been waiting for you because we need to um, look at what your scores were. So the person said, is it a typewriter? And he said, no, but we need to. And, and so the conversation went on, and this person left the room. Now, at another time, I was in fact sitting beside a typewriter, and I didn't know. And the person I was scoring and I looked at it and I went, oh, this is this person's typewriter. And I just kept quiet. And you know how we all would score as well at the table? So everybody was talking, and someone wanted to score score. And this individual told a very senior person that the they gave this particular person full marks because they were from the district and they wanted to see the district there. And I was just thinking in my heart, I was feeling, oh, but you know, the person who really did well, and that's my, I mean, from my division. And I was like, that's my division, but I told myself, but that is not the first thing I did somebody else. So, these things happen, yeah. which is the example you gave where somebody went in and it's not their something. Yeah, so, you know, again, just we can say it in here and you can spread it and you can take it back to your club and your area and your division and your district to be impeccably, um, and be impeccable with your standard of behavior as a judge. Right? Because people hear you, people see you, and it just ruins your reputation. Right? And and then it it adds to that, oh, contests are so rigged, or the person never wins, or I hate contests, I won't compete in contests. People, some people don't compete in contests because eh, the winner never wins. <laughs> and isn't there, like, integrity isn't that part of yeah. the core mm -hmm. thing? Well, with the first core value is so yeah. not just <laughs> integrity, yeah. which means that our intentions, our words, and our actions are all in alignment. So that's integrity, and I can't see that that would be an integrity gap. Okay, so number of contests. So that's about a tiebreaker judge, just to be really clear that uh, when you use it and when you open it. Um, the number of contest judges. So at contests, you have it says that you have at least five voting judges at a club contest, and you have a tiebreaker judge, you have three counters and two timers. So in some clubs, now you know why we have a minimum, minimum of 20 members in the club. <laughs> or invite a lot of guests that are Toastmaster members. Area contest to gain a minimum five voting judges or equal representation from the clubs represented. Right? But clubs doesn't have an equivalent or an or. So you have to have at least five voting judges at a club. And then you have to have at the area, of course, you have to have all those other rules of being division. You have to have a minimum of seven voting judges for equal representation from the areas. Again, this is in the rule book. Jeez, I'm so cold. It's so oh, freezing. <laughs> um, and the, at the division, judges can't be from the clubs that are represented in contestants, right? Again, it's that keeping that clean and checking in. So it, it's a challenge when you're running around at division and just looking for judges, and then people start winning contests and you start losing judges. So you always want to have a few backup. Um, and then I'll, le I'll let you read in your contest rule book about the regional quarterfinals, semifinals, and the international contest. Okay, we'll talk about those as we get further on. Um, so let's have a look at the ballot. Um, let's have a look at um, which ballot you want to look at. Let's look at table topics first. Do you want to take a break? Do you want a five minute break? Yeah, yeah. okay. Let's take a ten minute break. <laughs> Warm up. <laughs> so I can get hard now. <laughs> Magic.
Everybody should have one of these in their purse or pack or belt. <laughs> Okay, so we want to just briefly, before we go in, we're going to look at the criteria of table topics. If you want to pull up the table topics um, format or judging form when you're looking on your devices there. So first of all, look at some of, we talked a bit about this, but let's look for a moment at what are the things that get in the way of being objective as a judge. So we talked about, and David actually mentioned, what about uh, the first person, the first person that speaks, right? So the perfect, that perception that the first or the last speaker is the best. You hear people when they draw speaking orders going, oh, I will oh, great, I'm last, all oh, remember me, right? Or, or, oh, you're first, oh, too bad, so sad, you already lost, right? Yeah, so watch that as a judge because you're the one that's in charge of that. It's not who's first and last, it's who's the best speaker. So again, watch that assumption of first or last. Um, how many of you ever want to help that person that stumbles or just not up to speed? You just, oh man, if they just, oh come on, let's give them a chance. Right. That's not your job as a judge. Go home, take social work, whatever you want to do, get a job helping people, but do not do that as a judge. That's not what we're doing. Uh, so watch that. Watch the. Um, how many of you have seen people that show up year after year after year after year in contests and go, Oh, let's just give it, let us oh. give it to them and let us go. No. <laughs> no. Then you're encouraging them. <laughs> yeah, we're encouraging them. Yeah. And this is one of the this is one of the things I struggled with that or one of the things that was very interesting when we looked at how are we going to run the regional for the semi-final contest because when we had regionals, we used to compete against the same people every year, so all the districts would send their, their district winners, and often Region 9 would send Ridge Hopkins, and the next year Region District 9 would send Ridge Hopkins, and the next year Ridge would move to District 7 within the region, and they'd send Ridge Hopkins. And we saw Ridge Hopkins like for about 10 years every year at the regionals. And we went, when we had semifinals at the international, how do we get away from those people that don't want to compete because they go, Rich Hopkins going to win every year. He's always at regional and he's consistently winning to go to international. And so people get discouraged and they don't compete. So at the international level in the semifinals, they actually randomly draw districts out of a hat. And that's literally what happens. All the numbers of the district are put in a hat and they're drawn out in random order for the semifinals. These are all the, these are the ten speakers for semifinal number one. They're there. These are all the, and that's how they're drawn. So that we're competing against different districts all the time, not the same people. So if, for example, Rich won his district, he would be competing against nine different districts that year that he competed against the year before. Our chances are it would be up. So some of that, there's some, um, you know, we see them again and again, so the second time around, or we go, oh, they're so much better this year than they were last year. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Are they the best in the contest? So really important to keep that. Again, it's like the rich um, on another level is, People say, oh, we just keep having him win and he never wins at international. Let's give somebody else a chance. And again, it's just putting that aside and saying, we're picking the winner. Might be Rich, but it might be Mike, or it might be Pat. So watch that bias. And then this addresses the formula. This addresses the formula when you're a judge. What if something's done that's not the norm? 
And I don't mean the person norm. I mean, what if it's not the normal way things are done? Yeah. Like, in other words, somebody that's in a speech contest is totally different. Than, yeah. Yeah. That's really hard. Well, well then that's a I'm a speaker in a contest where that happens. And I, I thought, oh, is that in the criteria? Like, and I said, what? Sure. Yeah. Some examples. So, well, um, I've seen I've seen an international speech um, where somebody actually came out and drew physically brilliantly, in my judgment, drew a box, and then lived his life in and out of that box. But he created such vivid pictures that you could see the box. And there was without a doubt that that box was there, and he managed that box, and it was so unusual that I think people were mystified at how to judge it and what to do with it. Kind of like mining? Well, it wasn't mining, but he just described that there was this invisible box in our lives and how we moved her around, and it was brilliantly done. I've seen people bring step ladders and go up a step ladder. Mm -hmm. Um, all kinds of stuff that can be done that you go, well, that's not normal. <coughs> what if it's brilliantly done? What if it doesn't break any criteria? What if, what if, what if? And so as a judge, to just put your bias aside and go, how does it fit with the criteria? That's all I've got to go by is the criteria. It's not for me to decide if it's right or wrong. What if they put a pair of underwear on top of their suit? <laughs> well, in my books, under appropriateness, they lost all their marks. But if their content and their delivery was good, they might still end up winning an international speech contest. Yeah, they did. We're choosing the movie. Part of the criteria is the actual assessing the language of the speech. Often people will manipulate the language to their benefit, but includes poor word choices or inaccurate word choices. How do you handle that? Uh, again, individually, because what see the thing to remember is that you, the judge, are an intact human being. And the most important thing you can do is judge everybody by your criteria. Because it's all relevant. Because at the end of the day, you'll have this person first, you'll have this person second, you'll have this person third. Doesn't matter how much if you're in the criteria, as long as you're judging the criteria. So, for example, I am a low mark. People get into ju chief judges try to tell us how to mark our ballots. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I have my own way of marking the ballots. I must. I must. I'm a low marker. But it doesn't matter because they're not taking my score. I mark every one of those speakers low. It's all relative. I still get the same standing as somebody that is judging it on the criteria that marks them high. So I'm a hard marker gra grammatically because I'm kind of a fuss budget about grammar and I hear it and it is, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> if it's improper grammar. So grammar in my contestants gets slammed. But every one of them does, right? And it's only one small criteria, so it doesn't affect anything else. And that's the part that when I get ticked off that they're not using correct grammar, I can't let that affect their content or their delivery. Can't let it ooze into the other part, and that's the objectivity. Um, prejudices and personal uh, preferences can be another. So whatever that might be, whatever that might be. So just be aware of what happens when you when you judge and how you put yourself aside and become the criteria. So when I judge, and I don't know, I've been in Tillsmasters 36 years, and I've been judging since the first year I was in. 
I never go to a contest without at home sitting down and not reading the front, but reading the back. And thinking, what does this mean? So I haven't got it memorized yet. I've been doing it for 36 years. And I still review the criteria and think, what does this mean? So let's look at table topics contents. Let's discuss what this means for you as a judge. So you have the first of all, you look at the content for table topics. First of all, table topics topic. Who sets the topic? Chief, uh, the uh, contest, contest chair. chair. The contest chair sets the topic. Contest chair says right in the rule book. Contest chair sets the topic. Please do not pick some stupid closed-ended. Oh, would that be judgmental? Yes. <laughs> do not pick a closed-ended question or something that's set up for a specific expertise. Have a general, the purpose is not to prove the intelligence of the speaker, right? What's the purpose of the talk in a table topics contest? Give them something to talk about. Yeah, to give the person something to show their skills with, right? So if you want to say, um, discuss the pros and co uh, cons of the latest um, signature in the Senate, if you've read the newspaper lately or whatever it is, and people are going, what are you talking about? That's not conducive to a good contest. Oh, wow. I don't think of course it happens. happens. Yeah. I don't think political should be. No. And I saw yeah. them, she was like a Hillary Clinton, why she should be president or something to that effect as one oh, of the, no. and I just thought, what? thinking of choosing that topic. In Toastmasters, generally, the unwritten rule is no politics, no sex, and no religion. Yeah. We're not here to debate that. We're here to be inclusive, to, to be together, and not to debate those kind of things. And everybody's going to have a, stand, a personal bias, right? Um, so be a place where it's inclusive. Think about the question. So what might be a good question if your table topics um, contest chair. What's your favorite season and why? Okay, what's your favorite season and why? And anybody got an interesting one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a word! You're right, your wife is right! You are water. water. <laughs> well, that's that response could be brilliant because the winner actually tied that to the <laughs> apple products and brought in the beautiful why you love the ball. So, oh, yeah. I mean, it's so wide open that you have all kinds of variety. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so it's an example. What some other ones that you've heard? Share your superpower. Okay, superpower. Okay. Make sure that it's open. So sharing, yeah, give an example. Make sure that it's uh, open so pe and got lots of breadth so people like, can go and tell a story. They want to, you want to have an opening, you want to have a body, you want to have a conclusion. You let them tell a story in their table topics. So give them bread, expansion, set them up for success. Yes. I recall there was one instance three years ago I was in Finland. That was, that was District 95, and, and I went to their division contest for the table topics. And the topics was zombies are my best friends. What do you think about this? this okay, you're nuts. I'm finished. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so it, again, interesting. So what would people have to say about that? What do you think? If you were a contest chair, would you like to use that one? You know, you have to define zombie. What does that mean? Does that mean somebody that's partying all night long and or a zombie the next morning? <laughs> yes. I want to hear an interesting speech, something that's dynamic and colorful and what the religious show can think of. And if you get to the point where all your speakers are like, uh, I don't know what to say. Zombies, yeah. And then <laughs> it makes it a lot more challenging and you're really not judging based on what you're looking for. Yeah, so think about all the variations and all the challenges. They're nervous. Ask them a question that they can respond to, not having to try and, like, you want to make it interesting also and engaging for the audience. So in the past, one of the contests I was at was that the topic for table topics contest was yellow. <clears throat> I had blue. Oh, you had blue. Oh, how how 
creative. <laughs> so ask a question, because if all you want to do is engage the speakers so that we can judge them on their impromptu speaking, not on their brilliance of being creative and innovative and, and random thinkers. That's not what we're judging. We're judging on the speech development, the content, the delivery, and the language. Right. Yes. So how close to the question do you have to have the content? Because I've been instructed somewhere along the way that if I'm asked a question like, are your best friend a zombie or something like that, if I, if I started rattling on about, well, my best friends aren't zombies, but they are Finnish people or something, and then go on, go on that tangent, is that is that deviating from content or? Well, I think that's a beautiful segue into yeah. let's having a look at content. <laughs> yes, thank you. Because it's 55%. So in table topics, obviously, we want them to make sense. We want an interesting story. We want engagement. And we've got 55% of, of what they're doing is about the content, what they're saying. So we want speech development. And this is the way the speaker puts the ideas together so that the audience can understand it. If you do not understand what they're talking about, take points off. This is about you. It's not about the audience. It's about you as the judge. I used to sit and think, I'm probably the only one that doesn't understand them. And what I've learned <laughs> since, many, you know, a long time ago I used to see that. Now I think, there's a lot of people in this audience that don't understand what they're talking about. I don't. So. Oh, the audience of the growers? No, yourself. You <laughs> might. Um, it's pretty hard to look around and get that as a judge because there's so much going on. I wouldn't do that. If you don't understand it and if it's not linking <coughs> together, just take that. Be careful of the in, in structure. Yeah, speech development. Yes, Mikey. This might be a tough question for you. So I don't want to make my, up my, question, my question is. That when I judge a con contest, I'm, I'm usually a little bit worried that for just for the speech the content or, yep. or development part, because if if there's any element in the speech that references to the pop culture, I might not even aware of that because I don't speak, I don't grow up here. Yeah. So so I might lose the connection with the speaker, but at the same time, if I observe if this if the audience gets some chuckle, you know, then I know that the rest of the room understands it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, those people who don't speak, who don't grow up here, might not have that connection. So how do you judge based on that? Well, you're the you're the judge, so you get to judge it the way you want to. If if I was sitting there and I didn't understand comment, but obviously everybody else did, I'd let it go. That but that would be my approach to that. Okay. On, on the other hand, if we went on and on about something and I didn't understand what they were talking about, I'm going as as the judge and as the audience member, I don't understand what this is about. That would impact the development of the presentation because I couldn't follow it. Okay. So it's a judgment call in judging. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's and as the speaker, they have a responsibility to make sure that the audience understands. So if I get up and talk about jargon, so I get up about coach, talk about coaching, which is my career, and I talk in coaching jargon, and you're all sitting out there going, I don't know what you're talking about, then I'm ineffective, right? So that would impact the story. So you would have, the other thing to look for as a judge when you're into speech development is what is their purpose? So sometimes you, we know that it's to inform us, sometimes it's to entertain us, sometimes it's to inspire us, you want to know what the purpose is. What what are they trying to do? So that's that's something you want to look for, and that's all in speech development. That's the first thing we do when we go to develop speech. What's the purpose? Who's our audience, right? Then it has to have an opening body conclusion, and then relevant examples, illustrations, facts, and figures, and delivered smoothly. So that's all under the uh, content for speech development, which is 30 points. So that's a lot of processing for 30 points, right, in your head. 
And then 25 is effectiveness of that. So logic, directness, enthusiasm, achievement of purpose. You have to know that there's a purpose. And audience response gets, so you're gauging that out of 25. And here they go, and here's where it's subjective. Your subjective judgment on how the response came across. Were you able to determine their purpose? Did the speech directly relate to the given question or topic? And was the response clearly and logically presented? So this is where, if they didn't answer the question and you want to take points off, it's going to come out of the 25 points that deal with effectiveness. You don't slam them in every category. It has to go in here. So that's the difference when you're judging. There's categories where it comes out of the best speech. But you know, you can give the person 25 points even if they did not answer the question, but their reasoning and their presentation was yeah. admirable in how they changed the topic. Mm. So you don't even, I think that uh, could be used that way. Well, and, 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 and as a judge, you get to, you, um, get to discern that because it says, did the speech relate directly to the given question or topic? So if I make reference to it and build from it, as long as I take you on the journey, I might not get deducted. If you're a stickler for them answering the question, that's the discretion that you have right there because it says that it's your subjective judgment of how the response came across. Mm -hmm. Very rarely you take those four things and sort of take that 25 points and chop it in four and say, okay, you get so much for this, so much for that. That's a part of the rating scale. If you have those four things that are in those four areas that are in there, basically in there and saying under effectiveness, you have logic, directness, enthusiasm, purpose, and audience response, those four things, you sort of chop that 25 points up and say, okay, we've got seven points for this. And... Uh, I don't judge that because it's not a mathematical equation. I don't judge like that. I look at effectiveness and I. And I say, wow, I, in, all, in all of that, this is what I think. I think they were super enthusiastic, and it was appropriate, and I like that. And, and they certainly achieved their purpose, and uh, the audience appro responded appropriately. So quietness can be the audience response. We're not talking about laughter or, you know, it doesn't have to be out loud. It can be nodding. It can be total quietness, <coughs> rapture, eye contact. All those things can be the audience response. So watch what you put in there. I would not get into a mathematical equation. I'm just curious, I'm yeah. Just that. yeah, yeah, good question. So physical. Let's get physical. Physical. <laughs> so it carries part of the responsibility for effective communication. Appearance reinforces their response. Body language supports points through gestures, expression, and body positioning. Speaker makes effective use of and stays within the designated speaking area. There we go. So under physical, this is where you've got the speaking area. So this is where somebody, if they're out of that, you might say, you know, I'm gonna take some points off for that. You decide how many you take off. Was it really bad? Or there, it doesn't say how many come off because of it. You get to decide. And again, here's where I like Gestures that are natural. I don't know. So this is where a lot of, for me, contestants get slammed. I get low points for really wild, crazy, off the, off the top, no purpose gestures. And I, and I think this is one of the weaknesses of, of Toastmasters when we start out is that we get so focused on gestures and we have people doing all these and the tree was this high, and I brushed them off my shoulder. And I'm going, do you talk to your friends like that? Is that how you talk at work? So it's like, what's authentic? And, and what is your standard? So you have to decide what your standard is. I know what mine is. Is you have the discretion of 15 points in that delivery about that. And that's what this is about. That's why we study these forms, is going, this is what I want. Because I know what I like in a table topics. And when they walk up, I know the criteria, and I'm, 
measuring that, and I'm consistent with measuring that, right? Okay, so voice. And, and again, we have to train our voice, or we have to train our ears to hear the voice. So is the voice engaging? Does it have different tone? Does it have different rate? Does it have uh, volume? What's going on, right? Flexibility, does it move around? And we look at that. Okay, any questions on delivery? Just a question. I'm sorry, I missed a bit of the first. I apologize for being late. Um, when you're judging, are you judging per criteria, or are you judging vis-a-vis -vis the different contestants? So, like, if I'm judging and, and I give this person a, a ten for her content, and then the person right after has a little bit better content, I give him an eleven. Or do you see a, a speech and say, well, that that's a seventy-eight in my mind kind of speech? Do you, does that make sense? Like, are you judging? Well, the question against means, each other, or, or do you have kind of a criteria in your mind that that defines what a mark would be? Okay, so I think that's a great question. What do you do? Do you judge against the other person? Do you compare one to the other, or do you not? So some people say, oh, you should hold your form back so you don't know what to put for the other one, and then they sneak around and they look at it. I go, why are you holding your paper? <laughs> like I, I look. I've seen people do that. <laughs> because somebody <laughs> told them five years ago they could hold your paper. Yeah, I know. Like, you just do it. And they told me to do it. And I'm like, no, that's not how I do it. Well, I don't. I compare. I go, oh, I gave 10 there. Yeah. This person was better in that. And I make it 11 or 12 or whatever it is. Because I try to keep relative <clears throat> to the benchmark. And I don't. It doesn't matter if I gave 20 or if I gave. 30 for speech development to the speaker, number one, and somebody had better content, then I give them 31. It doesn't matter. This is a guide, right? And you can change those numbers after. Of course. Mm -hmm. Nobody sees it. It's yours. I've, I've it goes back to what you And at the end, you look at your scores, and I look at um, my first speaker, my second speaker, my third speaker, and I look at the scores and I go, okay, was the highest score really the best people talk to speakers? And that's that my too. second sober thought, right? Yeah. That's my just check back. Because our, it might be that I was wowed by somebody's um, presentation and I go, whoa, I gave them, that's out of, that's out of proportion, right? So you have to check back, make sure you're back in the criteria. It's not, it's not, um, yeah, there's, there's no hard lines except following the criteria and you measuring and keeping track that you're not the first person's the star or the last person's the star because you're tired and anything will go, anything will run by you, right? Jen. I'm glad to hear you speak this way about comparing because literally in the end we are comparing and for yeah. me, I think that there's so much injustice a lot of times to the first speaker. We forget, yes. forget, forget. Yes. And this doesn't leave them on the table like no. can so often happen. It, or any of them. Because remember, your role is to pick the winner. Well, if you don't go back and check your numbers and say, this is the winner, your job's not to hand in your score sheet, it's to pick the winner. Yes. I find that it's really hard, especially when there's eight contestants. Yep. That by the time you get to seven and eight, like your mind, and it's just is so much work, all the judging, especially when you have two contests happening back to back, and you have had eight speakers, and now you're doing eight more. Yep. And I often will find that, oh, number two did a little bit better than number one, and then number three didn't do as good as either of them, and then number four didn't do so good, and number five didn't do so good, and oh, number six did way better than these last two, and then Number seven ended up doing a little bit better, but then number seven got the highest score. But yet, when I think back to, wait a minute, number one and two, did number seven actually really beat one? And so, yeah. I mean, that's the thoughts that go through my mind, too. It's like, oh, and then I'll, I might have to go back and change it. But I know it's just like the, the long, like the eight speakers and then eight speakers. Like, those are really long and hard contests on yeah. a judge. Like, and, and, you when, up and when you're changing it, no, you've still got criteria. Yeah. Right. So somebody yeah. could be wowzers <laughs> in an area, but but bombed in something else. All right. And so 
see if they know you can get much in, oh, maybe their voice. Maybe they've got this monotone, monotone, monotone <laughs> voice. Well, and then I'm going, no, that person wouldn't win anyway. So, <laughs> um, and appropriateness. Yeah. So, anyway. You have to you have to decide. That's why you're the judge, and that's why you're asked because you've studied this and you know what you want in the table topics, Mike. So when I judge, I think something I like to share is that I find it helpful to to put just a little note for yourself beside contestants' names, just to just to remind you what the speaker was talking yeah. about, so that you can have some memory. Yeah, yes. I always, 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 always write down notes on my speakers. So when I go back and I've had eight table topic speakers, I know what they talked about because I might not remember what Mike said, and I make notes. The same as in the contest, I always write the titles down because then I can go back and I can go. Oh, that person talked about the the wreck of the Ella Fitzgerald. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any evaluations I write up what the conclusion yeah. was, if they had one. <laughs> so, because they're supposed to summarize yeah. what they told them. So, just on top of what Mike said, not only do you need to remind your, uh, this is just a suggestion uh, from someone who's used to evaluating uh, personal situations, but it's the why you provided that specific mark. So, not just the, what the topic was about, but whether it was a vote override or what it was specifically about that future action. Yeah, if you've got time. Yeah, again, you have to be really super careful. So one of the things that I do in international speech contests when we're listening, uh, I put pluses and minuses. Uh, oh, there was something I really like that really stood out. And then because I've got the title, I can go back and I can go, oh yeah, that was that was. And I don't have to write even down what the pluses were. I know that something impressed me at the moment, right? Because it's the delivery at the time. Okay, so we've got 55% in table topics content, really important that the person makes sense, puts it together, has a well-crafted speech. Table topics is a mini speech, so we're looking for all those components. The delivery, same as if they were delivering a, a presentation that was well-rehearsed and, and engaging. And then their language, appropriateness to the speech purpose in the audience, and that would be, you know, for me it's jargon and all those things that help us um, not understand or that aren't there so we can understand. So that the language promotes clear understanding and fits the occasion. And then correctness. Again, this is about grammar and pronunciation. Okay, so you've got a discretionary 15 points or 15% of the points for that. So at the end of the day, you have this beautiful mini presentation done in front to you and you go wow that person's like they spent weeks preparing that <coughs> fantastic right? you, you go through it easily and simple but follow makes sense blah, blah, blah. any questions on table topics hmm. yes you just go back to the beginning when you were talking about the first is the first and last or best, whatever. There is a there are videos on Inter Toastmasters International that talk about biases and that sort of thing. What's yeah. your take on those videos? I haven't watched them all, so I, I don't have a take. What's yours? I find I I think they're not pinpointing enough to to um, make statements. I find they're very highly generic. And I always want to think, oh, but you know, are they considering X? And it, I don't know if it's me or them. <laughs> or, or, or the partnership of you and them. Yeah. <laughs> what you want and what they give you. Yeah. I don't know if you come and watch them. Yeah. Okay. I just have one comment. Yes. Sorry. It, it, this is really striking to me because I, I find it quite fascinating the correctness. At five percent, is that right? Five points. And I, I, I really like that because if we have a second language speaker, I'm looking maybe at the different one that they are, I'm looking at the same one. So if we have a second language speaker, I find sometimes um, that 
in judging, it can really lower the point. And I think it's really, really important for the judges to be aware that we have a second language speaker and the grammar is not up to snuff or the word selections that are chosen, it's only 5%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this, this is my takeaway today. Yeah, and so that's really important to keep in mind. Where it may also impact you is the effectiveness in the content if, if language and sentence structure. But pronunciation, like you can't slam somebody if they say a boat or a boot, <laughs> which they love to do is get the states, right? Yeah. <laughs> or whatever it might be, and anything like that. And that just goes in 5% category. Yeah, and yeah. it's funny, I'm going to pick on John because um, I find sometimes uh, instead of saying her to a female, you might say her to a male. So it's, yeah. it's, a, it's the language. Hard to right? pronouns, right? Yeah, yeah so it should be totally judged upon and based on this selection. This is really yeah. good. Yeah. So great. And that's that's the point of reviewing these all the time. Because you haven't done it, you haven't looked at table topics evaluation or the judging form since the last one we had, which could be eleven months. Right? So important to review them. Let's look at evaluation. Can you find evaluation? Hmm. My favorite contest of all times. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> evaluation contest. So in evaluation contest, the uniqueness is we have a test speaker, right? And the test speaker really needs to be recruited early. And to do a five to seven minute speech, and ideally to do a manual speech, why waste a speaking slot? to do because then you've got some criteria on there. Yeah. Okay. And they must be, the test speaker must be a Toastmaster in good standing. You cannot bring somebody from outside. I used to be an old practice until we got rules changed in response <laughs> to people doing weird things. Yeah, they, we had a, a district governor, or a district governor, this is a number of years ago, over on the west, you know, on the east side of the United States that brought their family in, who then became the test speaker and some of the judges for the contest. <laughs> we'll pick it up. Right. Best rules got changed. <laughs> be a member. Yeah. Wanted an objective viewpoint, so we'll bring the public in to evaluate to judge our contest. Okay. Uh, judging contest for evaluation. Analytical quality, 40%. Why do you think this is? You're evaluation. <laughs> That's right. You have to be analytical in this process. So listen, look at what they say. The effectiveness of the evaluation. Every evaluation should carefully analyze the strengths and the weaknesses of the speaker's presentation. So you as the judge need to give thought, what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses that they're covering? Were the evaluator's comments clear and logical? What's logical to you? It's going to be different. You're going to have a different standard than me. We're not all going to be calibrated for this when we walk into the room. Did the evaluator indicate specific strengths and weaknesses of the presentation? So that's for 40%. Clear and focused on the front side, but that's what they're talking about. So when when evaluators get up and they go, oh, I really liked your presentation. If they're not talking about strengths and weaknesses, analytical is just delete, delete, delete in my calculating brain. So I, as the judge, I'm listening and I'm actually putting marks down. I mark. I have a cheat sheet in evaluation contests as a judge. And I put marks for strengths and weaknesses because I want to know what they've covered. This, is, this one's easy to evaluate or easy to judge. Recommendations, positive, specific, and helpful. In recommendations, do not just tell them to do something. If you don't show them or give them something very specific, they don't know how to do it differently where they would have done it. So tell them or demonstrate to them what to do. Hey, that will give you points. 
So an evaluator not only points out the strengths and weaknesses, they offer specific recommendations for improvement. Recommendations should be practical, helpful, and positive, and they should enable the speaker to improve their next presentation. So this speaks to being, you know, the you know the incline, it has to be at the right uh, level of that speaker's development. So if they're a brand new speaker, and often we have those in evaluation contests, if they're if this is their second speech, we don't know it because that's not how they're introduced, but you get a sense of this is a natural speaker, they don't have a lot of the your sense is that they're they're a beginner speaker. Make sure that the gradient of your feedback gives them relevant or appropriate comments of things to do next. Yes? Just to follow along that line of reasoning, is it not more beneficial to pick a seasoned speaker so that the evaluators actually have to work, work for it? Because if you give them somebody who's a new speaker, they're, they're all going to probably largely comment on the same thing. Uh, it's a philosophical discussion that I would love to have with you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I personally think that it, they should, well, I personally would prefer not to have a beginner speaker because I think that as evaluators, your, one of your key skills that we're looking for is your ability to analyze, to listen, at analytical listening and mechanical, analytical thinking skills. So a more seasoned speaker, they're not all getting up and doing the same things, like take your hands out of your pockets and look at the audience, like all the basics. If you're looking at finer points, I, I think that really challenges. The other thing to be really careful of, and if you're a chief judge or a contest chair, please be very deliberate in who you choose as a test speaker. A couple of years ago, and my apologies to anybody in the room that may have chosen this test speaker, got up and recited a poem. That is not suitable for evaluating them. Because you can't talk about the language, you can't talk about the turn of phrase, you can't talk about how they put their thoughts together, the opening, the body conclusion. We were actually, the, the evaluators got up and they evaluated the person that wrote the poem. <laughs> it was, it was yeah. awful. I was, I was in the audience and it was the most painful contest I ever sat through. And I said, this should be just done away with and that started over. So don't fall into that. Yes. How do you know? How do you know what? How do you, well, if I should, chose Sean to be my test speaker, do I listen to his speech before? Well, I, I do you know. can. I mean, I Pick somebody you know. This person was known. This person okay. was known. But, but they would they probably didn't repeatedly use poems as their I don't know. No, but but you asked for what you need. So I, I would you be willing to be the test speaker? The requirement is to d deliver a contest like speech or a manual presentation that somebody can evaluate. So it has to be like a manual speech, not a not a reading. Yeah. It was super uncomfortable. And some of the contestants got up and lots of them didn't know the poem. That was the interesting part. And some of us in the audience, a lot of us in the audience did. Were you here? Do you remember that? Uh, there was a whole bunch of squirming back there where I was. Yes. Well, that's essentially the outside of the area of the mission. What do you think? I what was the question? Because then you have no experience for them, you don't have a reference point, and it's very difficult. Yes. Right. Yeah, so get an outside speaker. If it's in your club, in when your contest, invite somebody else, and not somebody that regularly visits your club. District, it's fun. For years, we used to invite the districts right across the United States border to come over and speak. Now we used to have an exchange with District 2 would come up and do our test speaker at our district conference and then we'd go down to District 2 and do theirs in the state of Washington. And it was perfect because the contestants never even saw this person before. They weren't standing around talking to the people um, during the conference or anything else. They just never heard them speak before, didn't know them, didn't know their personality. I haven't found anything that deals with that, but you want, but you're way better off to set people up for 
Hirsch. Because you get to choose, so, so be careful when you choose. I, I actually attended one contest where the evaluator, in giving the evaluation, said, you know, they were obviously from the same club, oh. and had said, you know, like, I know you're capable of doing this, mm -hmm. right? So it, you kind of think, okay, does that give them an advantage, or is it an actual disadvantage? Yeah. So I don't know, but yeah. Yeah, so when your contest chair gives serious thought to setting everybody up for success, it's really hard to about to judge somebody or to get up and publicly evaluate somebody that you see all the time in your club. You already know their weaknesses. They're vulnerable in your club, right? Yeah, yeah and also getting somebody that's not something I know. I've had uh, a lot of people, a lot, but a number of people contacted me already offering to be our guest speaker at the conference. And all of them from, well, one's from District 96 and one's from District 21. And I've shut them both down because well, exactly that, that they're known by certain pockets of people. And um, in District 96's case, it's people in the Lower Mainland that are south of the Fraser River in District 21. They're going to know the contestant, yeah. whereas people yeah. here from the island from yeah. being are going to have a fair opportunity because mm -hmm. you don't get to interact as much with them. So I am looking at possibly District 2 or at least somebody not well known in District 96 to be our yeah. best speaker. And I'd welcome to share one with you as well, Lisa. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so really, so think about that to so set people up and then your recommendations when you're evaluating. Really think about what they're doing. So while you should improve your body language or change your vocal variety, they need to explain how. And because recommendations is 30 points, I used to have a huge bias, and this is how I judge. With 30 points, I want to hear three really good recommendations. Now, it's not the gospel. It's what I've used. When I was in Australia, they their standard was two really good recommendations with examples fleshed out. And I can also agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But you have to... Be efficient and effective and quick. I just speak. Well, I just uh, yes. Yeah. When you watch a speaker, there's some speech, speech evaluation recommendations that are kind of more generic, like eye contact. It's kind of an obvious given, it's pretty easy to pick up on. Do you judge the recommendations based on how nuanced they are and how? Um, the more expert they are in terms of the evaluation, or um, I do, for me, it has a bit of weight. If it's if somebody goes up and does vocal variety, eye contact, opening body conclusion, and it's all the things that I learned in the first year, I go great. But I'm looking for something deeper, also. Yeah, especially in a recommendation for improvement. So I want them to talk about. The purpose of a pause and, and where it could have gone and how that would have added. Or um, I want them to talk about the transition. Transition is one of those things that's seldom ever addressed in evaluation, and it's the most frequently missing element in a good presentation. Mm, good point. Because people don't transition; they somehow you fall off the edge and they're onto something else. Like, well, where's the transition? But it takes more listening to, to look for transitions. So that's one of the things that I love to hear about in, in evaluation is the transitions work beautifully. I loved how you took the person across. We built the bridge for, so we could keep following you. Whatever it is. And then where do you include that within your within your judging or within this judging form? Well, it might be in a number of places. It might be my analytical quality if I'm analyzing their transitions, or if they didn't do that, it might be in my recommendations, that I would want them to be talking about that in recommendations. Yeah. yeah. Can you go back to something that was discussed much earlier, as in digesting everything? Yep. She mentioned about people with ESL, right? Yeah. You say you have to be judging naturally. My bad for not going to an international conference. That's okay, you get a chance to change that every year. Promise. <laughs> 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 See you there. Yeah. 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 So, you know, Italian is really good at speaking. God bless his soul, but he always does that, 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 speak of that, little, you know, um, 
go to the market and, and buy the, you know. So do they do that in the international? Because I can't see how a culture so ingrained to use that suddenly you have speakers that don't use that at all. Well, it, it, in the international contest, it's five, five points out of 100 <laughs> if you want to get the good grammar. Or do you have a, an accommodation for a national? What have you seen for those? Countries? Well, I've never seen an Italian on the international stage, so that would be a surprise for me. They make up for They make up for Well, again, if it's not purposeful, they'll lose marks, right? So that's how it goes. Okay, looking at technique for in the evaluation contest and the evaluators, you're looking at the, their technique. So this is about the way they present their ideas <coughs> and their recommendations. Do you feel hurt or do you feel encouraged, inspired by them? Uh, they have to be sensitive to the feelings and needs of the speaker because their only purpose in there as an evaluator is to support the continuous growth. Remember, we're back to evaluation. And, and encouraging the speaker in their future development. I love when an evaluator at the end says, or starts out by saying, I, something like, uh, my comments I hope will take you from where I see you as a 90% to a 95%, or something like that. Like I like the acknowledgement that you're doing really well without using those words, and the percentage might not work, but something like that that is acknowledging that I, that we're looking at the fine details of what you're doing. Right? Or you bring a lot of natural skills. Even with the beginner speaker, you bring a lot of natural talents and skills. And what we're going to look at is a couple of things that might that you could consider taking. So these things that are presented as an option to the speaker that you should. If somebody uses the word should in an evaluation, it they get they get dinged by me in number technique. Mm. Because you can should on yourself if you want, but don't should on me. <laughs> <laughs> so that language doesn't work for me in an evaluation because there's a judgment and an expectation. So um, sympathetic, sensitive, motivational, inspiring. But you, everybody wants to go home and try that. Uh, yep. I don't, like I don't know if this is just me for pet peeve, but what I really hate is when evaluators. When you're trying to help the person, right? And then they say, well, if I was to be nitpicky, then uh, if I had to choose something for you to improve on, I, I feel like that yeah. discredits you as an evaluator. That automatically, yeah. you know what? You shouldn't have been sitting there evaluating the speech if you had to choose something because that's your job yeah. is to choose something. <laughs> and so, like, I, I really, for the, you know, or I like it when they actually own it, they, yeah. when they say, you know what, I want you, this is what I want you to do the next time. And, or to try. You know, like I want them to own on. their job, yeah. right? I will look that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely as an evaluator to own it. And so you might look for that in terms of their, um, in under recommendations, even maybe positive, mm -hmm. specific, helpful, I don't know, summation. Where would it go? Then, well, it's, it's technique, right, technique is the manner. So looking at the manner, yeah. So see, see how we need this. Yeah, back here, here, and then here. Yes. In the last couple of years, I've heard more and more uh, speech contest evaluators doing the "I'm going to use the COD technique, cleaning the C's content and organization yeah. development." And it seems like those people that put those little acronyms in seem to be the ones that are winning. The contest mm -hmm. it, it, is that something that you, you where do you mark that? Well, is for me, I'm that? always looking at the criteria here. So I'm looking at their analytical quality because that's forty percent. So mm -hmm. did they really cover and talk about the strengths and weaknesses? I don't care if they've got some formula that they got in their head that they use, or if they tell me it's going to be COD. I still want strengths and weaknesses. I'm going back here. They get no points for COD. In my books, I want to listen to the recommendations. I want to know their their technique, sensitivity, motivation, right in their technique. I want to be inspiring and and a summary. So 
Yeah. yeah. The other trend I'm seeing is that more animated speakers that are more uh, flirting with the audience and entertaining are also seeming to do well as well. And it doesn't seem like there's any criteria in here that fits that. I'm not okay. judging them other than their voice. Well, a lot of evaluation contests I see turn into a speaking contest yeah. and just go back as a judge because often the winners of that are as a result of untrained judges that aren't judging according to the criteria. And they're going, oh, that was so fantastic. And I go, if the focus was on them, focus must be on the speaker that they're evaluating, right? So. Just go back to the criteria and judge according to the criteria. So, I've been at a, an evaluation competition where the speakers memorized what they yeah. wanted to say without the notes. Is that well? I don't care. I don't care as long as they're sensitive, engaging, encouraging. They connect with the speaker, uh, or otherwise their technique is crushed. So having the notes doesn't discriminate on it. No, there's not even a mention of notes. Talk about the international level. I see that there's no team. evaluation at international level. For the notes. Level? Maybe, yeah. yeah. We don't have, don't have the higher levels. State so evaluation only goes to district. Could that be part of technique, though? Well, like no, because it doesn't talk about notes. I mean, your method, uh, uh, in terms of sympathetic, sensitive, motivational, what does it I don't care if you memorize. It's not a memorize what you're going to say. So, so I speak. Um, I won the district evaluation contest. I have never seen an evaluation contest before. I went to the district, and because I had been the last evaluator in the area and division contest, so I've never seen another evaluation. So I went to the district, and I went and I did my evaluation, and I went up and I. Put my notes here, and I delivered my evaluation to the speaker and to the audience, and I sat down, and the next speaker came out and stood here and delivered all this presentation and speech and body language and vocal variety and this, and, I went, and I'm freaked. I'm going, oh my god, I just embarrassed myself so badly because I stood by the, behind the lectern and delivered an evaluation. And I'm on the contest. So <laughs> I don't know what this, if it matters. This presentation yeah, is not one of the it's not about It's not about whether you use notes or not. That's not here. You're looking at did they analyze it and, and what points they get for analysis, what kind of recommendations they gave, whether they were sympathetic, sensitive, they took consideration of the speaker in, and the summation. There's nothing about performance, there's nothing about their vocal variety, there's nothing about their use of notes, none of that. It's not their performance. Mm -hmm. Their performance is an analytical exercise and support. Hmm. I so was wrong. There's, it's not in the rule book. Read the rule book. Yeah, there's a form for it. There's actually a form provided to you that you can use to take your notes. I think the rule book says you have to use that form, actually. You do. Yes. Yeah, the, the actual um, right. this is officials will hand you the form to use. Yes. My experience with the district conferences is that there there is not actually a lecture on the stage, uh, so you can ask for it. You can ask for it. No, yeah. we put it on. I put it on on the on the last last year. Made sure that there was a lectern on it, and I told all of the evaluators, all the contestants, where that lectern was going to be and and how it was going to be set up, and fully expect them to come up with their notes and put them on the lectern. Whether they stay at the lectern is up to them. Yeah. Yeah, there's no mention of notes here, folks. Do not make up criteria because of what you've seen or not seen, because however they decided it, that's up to them. But we judge according to the criteria. And there's nothing about notes, use of notes, memorizing, using a outline method, nothing. None of that.
And then summation. This is a really important part of evaluation contests because lots of people do not summarize. <coughs> so what do you want for 15 points as a summation? I want more of that great speech, look forward to seeing you again. <laughs> that is not worth 15 points for me. Yeah, so in conclusion, that was a fantastic speech, and I, I think, and that was one of the things that they said, can't win with a B. 15 marks gives you 85% and that's a B. You can't win with that, but I've seen people win with it. <laughs> you have to, I, yeah, let's not go down that road, but you have to have, you have, to have a summation. Yes. And I, what, what would you expect, as a judge, if you were awarding 15 points, what would you like in a very brief period of time to hear as a summation? Summary of the strength, remember the strength, did good on blah, 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 and remember to work on blah, blah, blah. I want to know, tell us what you told us. Okay. Other comments? I would just reverse that. I would always finish with your some each other weaknesses and then finish on the strengths. Always finish positive. Okay. I like creativity. I like the creativeness of, of referring it to something else, like analyzing it in some way, just to reinforce it. Okay. I'm also looking for a little bit of emotional intelligence and understanding of the memory. Okay, give me an example. Or give us an example. It, it needs to be encouraging and not necessarily that you're slamming them at the end. You know, um, that's part of you the go back to technique on that. Also, when you get to the summary, it should be reiterating that same goal, not um, making them feel bad at the end. So watch when you if their if their summation or any of their comments are not nice or they don't do it in a supportive way, it goes down to technique. You're always going back to 15. Doesn't matter where, doesn't have any logic, it doesn't have happen in the first half or the second half. If their technique is not supportive, sympathetic, or um, sensitive or motivational, they get hit in the technique, right? So even in their summation. So Think about what you want to give them 15 points for. I want, them, for me, I like them to quickly say, um, you know, it might be back to what they said in the beginning, whatever their opening comment was, now they're bringing it back, which sounds like I know that they're finishing it. And I, you know, look at, I'd love to have you look at, and I just you know, have no idea because I'm here as a speaker. So, you know, I'd love to see you look at the unit, the effective use of cause, and, and uh, making a stronger eye contact with the group. That blah, 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 whatever it is to reiterate what you said, but not to go back and go all the way through again, but just touch lightly on the high points um, somehow. I have given more zeros in <laughs> summation in evaluation contests than I can tell you. I've sat through entire contests and never given any points in a contest for summation because people go, thanks, it was great to evaluate you, or whatever, and I'm going, what? <laughs> no summation. It misses, we miss it all the time because we evaluate, we give recommendations right to the last minute, and then jump out. And there's no time for summation, and they're scored at 85 right away. Which is fine. If nobody gives it, then it's equal. But if you just left 15 points, 15 points on the table. So as a contestant, if you're encouraging people in your club to evaluate and be in contests, look for summations. Okay. And as judges, 15 points for that value. But think about what you want in that summation, because they're only going to have probably like they might have 20 seconds to make those summations. So what if, what is it going to be in 20 seconds? Be realistic. Okay. Any more questions on evaluation? Okay. It's fun because it's the easiest fun to evaluate. <laughs> okay. Do we want five minutes to stand up and move around? Yes. <laughs> It's like a marathon. <laughs>
Um, not a sprint. It's like a it's like a district conference in Australia because they have four contests at the district conference. So you sit through the whole thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
engages the audience, moves forward to a significant conclusion so you can feel it building and going on. Development of the speech is supported by relevant examples, illustrations, facts, figures, delivered with smoothness, a framework, and presents the audience with a unified whole. So it is not stand-up comedy. It's this beautifully constructed speech. Effectiveness looks at partly the audience's reception. In large part is your subjective judgment of how the speech came across. If you do not like it, kill it in the 10 points. If you think it was totally inappropriate, kill it in the 10 points of reception or effectiveness. It's your, your discretion, yes. So Pat, as a judge, is it reasonable to see yourself as a sample of the audience rather than judging or <coughs> interpreting the audience's reaction? Well, it says it's measured in part by their reaction or their reception to it. I look around because sometimes there'll be people uh, think it's hilarious and there'll be other people not even laughing that are offended. So that was what would happen in the inappropriate speech. There are people that were um, offended that weren't laughing and, and not even listening, and there are other people that were laughing. Remember that we're in Toastmasters, and here's our core values. And the, if the presenter does not represent our core values and how they're presenting, if, if respect is not happening in that speech for anybody, then that's what we represent. So that's some place to go. Ask yourself, was I able to determine the speaker's purpose? Did it relate? To, did the speech relate to that purpose? Was the audience interest held? Was the speech subject appropriate for that particular audience? And that's what I always ask myself, was it appropriate? Would I want my grandmother to have sat through that? Would I want my father sitting and listening to this? Uh, value, and it talks about ideas, logic, and original thought. Now, original thought and humor is where the brilliance comes in, right? I love to hear things I haven't heard before. So speech value justifies the art of speaking. Isn't that brilliant? I go, you're taking seven minutes of my time. What did I get in return? Right. <laughs> and how many times we go, what a waste of seven minutes of time. <laughs> <laughs> Say you, the speaker has a responsibility to say something meaningful and original to the audience. To me, humor is tough. Tough. Listeners should feel that the speaker made a contribution to their thinking. The idea should be important ones, although this does not preclude a humorous presentation of them. So speech value, 15 points. Was it original? Was there something new? Yeah, there's no original thought, but is it an original approach? So if somebody gets up and talks about something that I've heard regurgitated every year, and, and, and it's a story, say that there's a theme that goes around, and it's about having the old boat, or whatever it might be. So I got this old boat, and I've heard it last year, and now I've heard a revision of it, and then... Uh, I've heard it somewhere else before, and I go, like, what's this? This is all being built on something that's out there. So was it original? I want to hear something original. And what is humor? What causes laughter? What causes humor? Resonance. The what? Resonance. Resonance? Yeah. Okay, surprise. Surprise. The elements of surprise. The unknown. So we go, we go here, and we have a quick turn, and we're left going like, <laughs> Right? Yeah. So they have to be creative, innovative, original. Yeah. 15 points for audience response. Attentiveness, laughter, interest in reception. So here we go. Um, right? Did it hold the audience's interest? Did they understand and laugh at the humor? And don't just say, well, if they laugh really loud, they get 15 points, and if they laugh medium loud, they get 10 points, and if they <laughs> laugh with just a little tease, that it's fun. the funniest person might get 
not get deli lops all the way through, but they might get consistently um, lopped. Mm -hmm. So think about that. There's no laugh meter in terms of reception right, or audience response. Okay, physical or physical. The delivery, 30 points delivery. Of course, humor is so much about delivery, right? It's timing. Everything in humor is timing. And so we look at body language, the speaking area, and appearance. And here we talk about uh, the speaker's appearance should reinforce the speech. So I find in the humorous contest, this is where People can change their clothing that sets the tone or adds to the humor. They might have props that would add to the humor. Things like that might be uh, purposefully used. Uh, whether the props are, or whether the appearance is profound, sad, humorous, or instructional. Body language uh, supports points through gestures, expressions, and body positioning. Now just think of how a person can move their body that would add to humor, right, or certain gestures. I, I always think the funniest presentation I ever, ever heard in a humorous speech contest was at a district level. And this woman came on, and she had a chair. And she set up her chair. She walked on stage, and she was introduced. And so I said, please help me welcome Pat Johnson, blah, 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 blah. And she walked over and she sat down. And she sat like this. And, and she was quivering. And I thought, oh my gosh, she's really terrified <laughs> to be on the stage. And she never changed her facial expression, and every once in a while her pleading eyes turned around to the audience like she was terrified that her body never quit quivering. And she told this story about flying for the first time. And her voice quivered, and she went on. And I was hysterical. I was falling out of my chair. <laughs> this woman never changed her, her tone, always was at this. At this frightened monotone level and, and it, she could feel the, the plane rising and, that, and her temperature rose as the plane was rising. She went on and on and on and at some level you would think, oh my god, kill me. Like there's no there's no variety, there's no body movement, there's no vocal variety, there's no gestures, there's nothing. And I, I will never forget that speech because she won hands down and she was hilarious. And I thought, what discipline to have learned to keep herself so in that fear that after a while, after she was one or two minutes into her presentation, you knew that she was so into the beingness of that flight and the things that she told us. She never cracked a smile, but she told all these crazy things and she was equating them to not knowing what was happening. And, and that you know, when the plane lifted and what that felt like and everything else, and she had all figured out, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. And I thought that woman was so disciplined and worked and, and wrote this tremendous speech that she really had to get into what's it like to fly for the first time. And I thought, what discipline to never move your face, never show any emotion, just to have this scared eyes all the time. And she was so into the character. When they came up to interview her, she stood there and they said, so tell us your name. My name is Pat. <laughs> she was just, and the whole interview, she did the same way. And I went, now I'm confused because I... I'm, I loved her, and I think she was hilarious. I don't know if she stayed in persona or if she used her lack of body language and expression and vocal variety and her total fear to write the brilliant speech <laughs> showcase that. I don't know whether it was the chicken or the egg, but either way, that was the funniest presentation I ever saw. Ever saw. She kept reliving the experience. 
Yeah, yeah. 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 so do I. Yeah. <laughs> that was uh, over 30 years ago that I heard her speak. How far yeah. up did she get? There? She was in the district. Because that's as far as we have. But we were sitting, honestly, we were sitting and we were almost falling off our chairs in the front row. I couldn't see the rest of that tears, right? Everybody was roaring. Yeah. So just uh, so brilliantly done. So use your, whatever works for you, use your strengths. Is, there's no saying what it is. So delivery, physical body language speaking area, voice, however you use your voice to deliver that humor and then manner. Stop me if you want to talk about any of these. Language, again, language here is five points for pronunciation. Okay, grammar, word selection, pronunciation, and then appropriateness of language again to the speech purpose and all of it. So here you hear a lot of different words used because you're looking for that element of surprise or timing. The biggest issue in humorous contests is appropriateness, right? Mm -hmm. So just clean it up at your area, or clean it up at your club level, and don't let it happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. If we have a question about that, where do we take it? International? Do we question them? Keep it outside? Uh, what do you want to question? Mm -hmm. so, um, well, appropriateness. Well, I mean, you know, when, if somebody's in, in the house <coughs> already, and you think, well, I, I had a question about that one time, and I did, I did talk on offsite to a, a few people. How do you think we're understanding that? Because that speech had obviously been accepted a time or two or even three. Yeah, well, you can't do anything about it when it shows up in the contest unless the judges say that it's not going to win. But as an outsider, you can't do anything about it. Even as a contest chair, it's in the contest, and it's representing an area or a division or whatever it might be, so the judges are left to judge with it or judge it. But um, I would be briefing, if I was involved in that process and I knew from an area or a division that was coming up to district, it wouldn't be now. What do we do at district level? Just international. Right? And the evaluation. Yeah. Okay. So so if I if it was coming out to my division and I'd heard it over an area, I would purposely um, talk to my chief judge about talking about um, inappropriate humor not getting through. So yeah, and for me the dilemma too is respecting the person who had who was the speaker and who put all that time and effort in. Yeah, like I, I like it depends on what your role is. So as a role of a district officer, I don't I don't think it's necessarily your right to go up to somebody that's in a contest and talk to them about what they're going to deliver. Right? You can't do that. Um, so what about? Um, I think it's all our responsibility at the club level not to let that go through, not to have that happen. If each one of us goes back to our club and somebody's doing dirty humor and we go like, I don't know, but like sexual humor is not what this is about. That's cheap humor to do something brilliant or bathroom humor. Question for you about that with the bathroom. Because I, I remember being a time of work contest, and it was a case in this room a couple of years ago where um, a, a female did a, a thing on pot, the porta potty. And a lot of people in the room, or a lot of people afterwards, had said, I heard from some people saying how inappropriate it was. Meanwhile, I thought it was hilarious. Um, but I wasn't a judge, so I didn't have to go through the judging criteria. But I don't know, like, and so when we say, like, I know that's literally bathroom humor, but I don't recall any, afterwards I was like, I don't recall her saying anything derogatory or uh, whatnot. Um, and yeah, she did have, I think she did have underwear over her pants, now that's in that comment earlier, but I don't know, yeah. So I think it, 
Like, I don't know how, who determines what's appropriate. I don't know if it was appropriate or not still to this day, um, but I know that some people left the, left the contest thinking that it was inappropriate and other people thought it, it was appropriate. And I think she did represent us at the district level up at the Tom Maris. Yeah. Yeah. So the and only th the only thing you can do, I mean, we all vote with our feet in our mouths, mm -hmm. and if you're a judge, you have to decide do you think it's appropriate or not. No. And it was judged already at a, a club in an area and a division or whatever, mm -hmm. and there, you can't stop that process. There's not a not that I'm aware of that you can go let's let's do this. Right. Right. So. But if it's not in violation of the, you know, the religion, yeah. the uh, politics, and the sex, uh, taking that out. I mean, I, I judged a, I was judging a, a UBC uh, uh, speech contest where they, uh, the person I was actually not judging, sorry, I was coaching a person, and their speech was about, was called potty time, mm -hmm. and it was. She was talking about her time where she needs to escape the schoolwork and all the other things. And the, the, the place to do it is just go into the women's bathroom, just sit down and just sit down and think and reflect and just de stress. Right. And so she would talk about that. And, and, and we did put a prop on the stage, which was a chair. And so she would just sit down and she would act out, not going to the washroom, but act out just being in there and having that opportunity to do it. And it was brilliantly done. Mm -hmm. And I coached it. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't win, though. Because, because I think people thought that there was a potty, uh, like a bathroom humor, and there was no, well, there was humor, but it wasn't bathroom humor. Yes, yeah, so you have to look at each instance yourself and say, as a judge, do I agree with this? Is this in good taste? Is this appropriate? Would I want to have this discussion with my father or my mother right. or my brother or my sister or whatever it might be? What, whatever your moral compass is, is this something that you would want the public mm -hmm. to see and listen to? Baseline is derogatory. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, if it really is derogatory to somebody, then it's probably not relevant. Yeah. Yeah, please a little. Well, yeah. well, but you're not pleasing the world from your perspective. Uh, you're 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 representing this organization. So that's also what you're doing as you're walking on the stage to represent this organization. So um, to look at respect, and I agree, and derogatory, you silence someone else. Like you can make fun of yourself. Right, like there's a, there's a lot of space to do uh, self deprecation. So anyway, just a word of caution because that's that's the most critical thing. And the humorous speech contest is very close to the same criteria as our international, with just a few numbers moved around. And, and to say that, and to bridge over, humorous, humor, there is room for humor in the international speech contest. People are saying, oh, you have to be serious. Well, you have to have a message. But if you choose to do that with humor, help yourself. Mm -hmm. That's your gift, way go. Doesn't say anything on the international speech contest that slam them, you can't get any points if you use humor, or take that out of here. <laughs> right? It doesn't say that. It says effectiveness, enthusiasm, lots of things it looks for that can come with humor. But don't take points off from humor unless something suffers. So don't be afraid of using humor and using all your skills in the international. Okay. So I want to spend the next uh, probably 10 minutes looking briefly at the international speech contest, and then we're going to have a speech contest. And you're going to be the judge. You get to use your analytical judging skill. Okay, have you got international contest criteria popped up? Good. Okay. Oh, do you have an extra one? Are you doing something else? What are you doing? Reading Netflix? Watching Netflix? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There you go. I'm writing, I'm writing your story. <laughs> okay. So let's have a look at international speech contest. Uh, here we got, we have content for 50%. Makes sense, right? What's the purpose of speech contest? Delivering a speech, opening body conclusion, transitions, examples, blah, 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 same thing, right? 
It all sounds familiar. Effectiveness, what's the purpose? Like always, everything comes down to purposes. The first thing you do when you write a speech, what's the purpose of your speech? Who's our audience? Right. Did we meet our purpose? Did we deliver? So again, and then speech value. I, here, there's no original thoughts, but it's how you present the thoughts. How you present it. What kind of framework? What kind of analogy do you use? Or what kind of stories do you tell that build around that story? So um, again, I have to read this because it's all the same stuff that we talked about. It says, uh, for speech value, justifies the act of speaking. Again, it's like, ask yourself, what did I get out of that seven minutes from my life? If it's the same old, same old, and there's no new twist, there's no new ideas, then low value. The speaker has a responsibility to say something meaningful and original to the audience. And the listeners should feel that the speakers made a contribution to their thinking. So that tells me that I want to get tweaked. I want to go, oh, I never thought of it that way before. And then I go, oh, that's thanks for them. And the ideas should be important ones, although this does not preclude a humorous presentation of them. There you go, right in writing, right in the back. So we want a thoughtful, a meaningful, a thought-provoking, a seductive, a provocative presentation. And you can, you hear these, people say, oh, it's the same themes all the time, you have to pick a universal theme. Well, guess what? You have to pick a universal theme because you've got an international universal audience that are all, or that are all judging you. Because at the international level, the judges are from one from each of the regions. So you've got six you've got six judges minimum that are not born in North America and probably most of the ones from North America that are judging were also born outside of North America. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got a few North Americans and you've got a whole bunch of the rest of the world. And and that's the reality. So your subject has to be something that people can relate to. And what is that? Love illness, um, children, joy, sadness, what, all those things, relationships, they're, they're universal, but find a unique way of delivering them. And you'll see that if you watch the world champions, they're universal topics, but they're very unique delivery. And what have you got to say? Uh, you know, one of the things that I always ask people who want to participate in international contests, my first question is, you've got seven minutes. What do you want to tell the world? That's what you want to talk about. What's really important to you? What are you passionate about? That's what you want to talk about. So you that, should go to Twitter because they often incorporate in there. In there. Yeah. I mean, I still think about the guy with Something that one. Yeah, Dan and Jara. Yeah. Um, Dan and Jaya. Dan and Jaya. I can't pronounce his name. So. Dan and Jaya Hadarachi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, got it. But you know, I watched Dan and Jaya develop because I was in Sri Lanka five, five or six years before he won world championship, and I saw him speak at the district level. Mm -hmm. And you know, he was competing every year. Like these people don't often arrive just by accident. They're building a craft, right? They're developing a, a skill. Yeah. yeah, he said as much. Hmm? He said as much. In, yeah. In he told us. Yeah. Okay, so delivery. So here you're looking at physical voice and manner. One of the things that I think is really interesting in manner, do you ever watch people when they move on a stage and, and look at how it affects the manner? Like, what do you look for when you when you look at manner, what determines directness, assurance, and enthusiasm? Like, what does that mean? Because it says, is indirect real, real revelation of the speaker's real self in manner. So that to me speaks of authenticity, genuineness, 
integrity in themselves, or what they're talking about, the involvement in it, that there's some of themselves in that, right? Speak with enthusiasm, assurance, showing interest in the audience and confidence in their reactions. So there's this, I'm not afraid of you, I'm connected to you. It's not I'm talking at you, I don't see you, I don't hear you, I'm just here performing. Performance doesn't work for me. I want connection. I want that speaker to feel like we had a personal conversation and the other 3,000 people were there. That's the sense I want when I watch a speaker. And when I'm a judge, I want that feeling. That's what I'm looking for in terms of their manner, that authenticity, that connection. It's also interesting if you watch people on a stage where they're delivering a seven-minute speech. It's different when you're facilitating or teaching or doing things like that. But watch on a stage how many times people that are speaking step forward or walk backwards on the stage. And people, when they start to lose their nerves, step backwards to disconnect. And if you don't, and if you notice it, you can hear it in your voice. Unless there's a purpose for it, but often it's there. So there's a psychological something that happens, and they start moving away, mm -hmm. and it affects their manner, their points in their manner. So 30 points for delivery. So obviously, the brilliant speech. Poor delivery will win over the fabulously delivered um, poor content speech just by the fact of the point. You can't go 50 against 30 and win. Like, superb delivery should not win an empty speech if the speech is empty. And then language, uh, again, appropriateness. And correctness is 10% here, the 10 points for appropriateness and pronunciation. So a little bit higher in the international speech contest. But we also have, that's why we have also um, contests in other languages, so people can speak in their, in their native languages. Okay. Any questions or comments? Yes. What about memorization when it comes to the international speech? Are you going to get more points for showing your confidence without the words. Yeah, it'll definitely affect the manner. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. That's where it'll go. It won't necessarily be because of the notes, but it'll be your connection, your confidence, and your... Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. When you just said about speakers speaking in their native language in an international contest and being judged by it that way, how do they? How does that continue? They don't. No, they just go to the district level. Okay. So when I was in district nine, what district? Eighty nine. Huh? Eighty nine. Eighty nine. When I was in district eighty nine, just before Mike went to eighty nine, and they had Mandarin, Cantonese, and English contests. So if you get tired of sitting through two contests, you should try six. <laughs> that you don't understand. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I listened to a lot of speeches. I had no idea, but I knew what Kathy sounded like, and I knew what Mandarin sounded like at the end of it. Didn't know a word. But <laughs> it's interesting how much you can pick up what the speech is about, though. Don't know the language. Okay, any questions? I just, yes, have, I just have a question on connecting to the audience. Yeah. Um, you know, I watched the ones that kind of won. Uh -huh. And. It's funny that you should say walking backwards. Now, what about walking sideways? That, that, that was, you know, you look at it and you're right about the point coming across the audience. But how do you draw them in those, just those first few minutes? Well, in my personal experience, because I've watched lots of the World Championship competitions on video, and I've been at them since 1989, so. Um, nothing compares to being in real. So you feel something in person that you don't feel on a video. Uh, there is, there's people that walk out on the stage and the whole place will just bristle. Or there's people that walk out and they'll just go quiet. 
Like there's there's some kind of energy of that person's presence, whether that's how they walk out to shake the hand or whatever it is. There's something that happens, and it and it just happens in a it, it's three thousand people responding to that dynamic also, right? So it's uh, pretty hard to gauge on a video. Uh, walking. So one of the things you'll see when you talk about walking sideways, there is very specific. And, and this is just good uh, prep for a contest, and I, I'm not making fun of it. Um, looking at the holograph. So what helps the audience really understand if you're doing a chronological presentation is that if this is the past place, and then you're the present, and then the future, it helps people in the audience really orient to that, and then you can go back to the present. So people might walk sideways, but they're, as long as it's purposeful, that's all. Mm -hmm. Or that they're not caught off and they're going, oh my goodness, I'm supposed to be over there. Mm -hmm. That's what's funny. <laughs> and I think that's good for a humorous speech contest. <laughs> not so much for international. <laughs> yeah, not for international. Okay, so let's, um, we're going to uh, have a speech contest. Are you all ready to judge? Mm -hmm. okay. Davis. Oh, oh, question? Can you repeat the point? The first, yep, I'll, I'll repeat the names, yes. The first person is Sean, S-H-A-W-N, Gold, G-O-L-D. The second speaker is Jennifer, J-I-N-N-I-F-E-R. Almeida, A L M E I D A, and then Louisa Davis. Okay, any other questions uh, regarding contestants? I am going to time. I've got uh, my, my timing cards, and so we'll, we'll time them and I'll keep track. I'll be the I'll be the timer, and when the contest is finished, uh, if you would uh, tear, you've got your sheet tear off, put the order of the, your winners. In this case, you'll place all three of them, but make sure that you put first place on the first line, right? No kidding, people do this in craft. Put first, second, third in the order. Right? Okay. And then I'll pick them up from you and we'll count them and we'll announce our winner. Okay. So our first speaker today is, oh, and how I'm going to do this is I'll say our first speaker today is person, I'll introduce them and I'll say their title, we'll come out, we'll shake hands, then I'll repeat the title and their name, and then you applaud, and then they can start, okay? That's how it goes. Yes? I thought that people, uh, before, they, when you mentioned, they introduced the speaker, then they applaud. When you second time, you say then we keep quiet. They just run. Well, you can do it however it gets, you're asked to do it. There's no standard way. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm going to introduce him and his title, he's going to come out and we're going to shake hands and while we're shaking hands he's going to applaud and then I'll repeat it and then he can take the stage and I'll disappear. Okay, our first speaker today is Sean Bold, Max Time. <laughs> Max Time, Sean Gold. Four years ago, I reached the lowest point in my 40-year career. I've been with the same company for thir almost 30 years, and I got boss number 21. Boss number 21 through 20 loved me, naturally. <laughs> Not so much 21. 21 didn't like me. 21 wanted to fire me. Can you imagine going to work every day 
knowing that your boss doesn't like you, wants to fire you, it's demotivating, demoralized, and depressing. Fortunately, a life-changing event took place just shortly after that. My daughter gave birth to a grandson, Max. I was there for the delivery. I cut his umbilical cord. I held Max in my arms, and I spent the night in that hospital. I learned some important things from my time with Max. Starting that first night, I learned that my speeches can put people to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned three other very important lessons about life. Manage what matters. Acknowledge your accomplishments. And exploit your experiences. Let's talk about that. Manage what matters. Why don't you take care of the basic necessities of life, food and shelter? The rest of the things you can actually take care of and manage, but they evolve over your lifespan. A clean diaper. Family and friends. An education. An occupation. Friends and family. And a clean diaper. Mm -hmm. Your priorities and your importance of each of those change over time. You choose how much of those are important at that point in time based on what your needs are. Right now, Max, who's three and a half, his priority is family and friends. But he's starting preschool, so an education is coming up next. His parents are focused on their occupation so that they can, they can take care of their kids, their family, that they can have the resources to do so. Mine? Well, I'm at the end of my occupation focus. I'm more focused on family and friends now. But I am worried about the diaper. <laughs> Acknowledge your accomplishments. We as Canadians don't often blow our own horn. Not like some people across the border. We do it maybe too much. We don't acknowledge all the things that we've done right. We should. We should acknowledge those positive things in life. But let's not forget that going to school is not an accomplishment. Graduating or getting, uh, getting a scholarship, that's an accomplishment. Getting a, going to work is not an accomplishment. Getting a good job, getting a promotion, those are accomplishments. Giving a speech is not an accomplishment. Giving a first speech or winning a speech, now that's an accomplishment. Max, he had to learn his accomplishments, what's important in his life. Right now, he can go to potty by himself. He can take off his pants, and he can go to the washroom, and he can flush the toilet, and he can pull himself up, and he can wash his hands. He can do that by himself. He's a big boy now, and he recognizes that. And we help him recognize that or acknowledge that accomplishment, because that's important. I've got an MBA. I've got a, I've got a Six Sigma black belt. I've got a DTM. Those are accomplishments. I can take pride in them. But some of those i got a long time ago. What have I done lately? What are my accomplishments that I can take pride in now? Sure, I got a second DPM last year and I'm working on another one now. But, so it's got to be focused on what have you got to focus on? What are your accomplishments? And when you have them, acknowledge them. Let people know. It makes you feel stronger and it allows other people to know more about you. Exploit your experiences. We have a lot of experiences in life, especially those of us who have gray <coughs> or missing hair. <laughs> Take advantage of what you've learned. Share what you've learned. Use it effectively. And if you don't have any experiences, join Toastmasters. Because you're already here, so you already know that this is a great opportunity to step up 
and get new experiences and excel. When I was a young teenager, I would babysit kids for money. I go to make money. I had a cousin who had an infant, a newborn baby, who wanted me to babysit. I was scared, but I took on that responsibility of babysitting an infant. That allowed me to make more money. It also meant that I would be a better father, and now a better grandfather. And as a result, I get all the opportunities I want to have maximized because of that experience. Three very important lessons I've learned. Manage what matters, acknowledge your accomplishments, and exploit your experiences. A simple acronym, M. A X. Max time. Boss number 21, I survived her. I am now on boss number 23. Life is good. Life is great. I'm ready to retire. I have nothing more to gain, but I have time with my with Max, and that's what counts for me. I survived. I've excelled because of what I've learned from my time with Max. Don't you all deserve? A little max time. Fantastic. Thank you. One minute silence for the judges to complete the ballots. Speaker is Jennifer Almeida, blind with vision. Jennifer Almeida. Why am I here? Have you ever asked yourself this question? Madam Toastmaster, Contents Chair, and members. I believe there are two things that drive us. Passion and purpose. <coughs> I believe that our passion and purpose can determine our profession. How many times have you looked back into your life and seen your biggest disappointment being your greatest appointment in your life, but at that time you didn't know. How many of you can look back to the past and think of the biggest adversities that you have had? And at that time, you felt life was over and everything was falling apart in front of you. But it was the best thing that ever happened to your family and you. Life threw you a curveball. You were blindsided. You didn't see it coming. But you went all out to make it happen. Let me share with you a real story about my deceased father, Mr. Joseph Almeida. He woke up one morning and he was blind. I was just four years old. Life threw him a curveball. Life was very unfair to him. He lost a very good paying job in accounting and had to take a life altering profession as an insurance agent. Because at that era there were very few jobs for the blind. He had to relearn so many things, and some of it could have been very dangerous. He had to relearn how to light a cigarette. He had to relearn when the edge of the furniture box so didn't bump into things. He had to relearn where the edge of the curb was so he didn't get hit by a car. Helen Keller said, the worst thing than being blind 
is to have sight and no vision. My father had an extraordinary vision. He was going to start from scratch at the age of 36 with a wife as a stay-at-home mom and four green kids, 14, 8, 6, and 4, while being the sole breadwinner. His passion was his family, and his purpose was to take us to the finish line, so we won the great game of life. To my father, I learned some life lessons. Don't hang out with doubt and worry. Make faith your new best friend. Always have fun along the way. One day we were crossing the road and he stopped me and said, Jack, wait. And he pulled out a scissors and a salt shaker. And I was going, what's going on? And he said, should I cut across or should I dash across? He always had a sense of humor. Another time, I took him to the pharmacy and he was tiptoeing into the pharmacy. And I said, Papa, what's going on? And he went, shh, don't wake up the sleeping pills. Everyone in the pharmacy was laughing. And every time when my mom agitated you, that's one liner. Guess where I met her? On a blind date. <laughs> Help others change their lives. He helped so many people along the way, but I especially want to share with you what he did for my mother's family. He financed his sister in law's wedding. He housed his aged in laws. Every time a brother in law lost a job, our house was readily available. He financed another sister in law's education in England and he raised his niece for 10 years like she was his very own. All with a meager salary while raising his own family. My father showed leadership. Leadership is empathy, caring and connecting with others to improve their lives. To my father, I've learned you've got to follow your passion and find your purpose. Your passion and your purpose can help lead you. And that is how you win in life. So let me ask you, have you found your passion and your purpose in Toastmasters? <coughs> if not, create a vision. Because your passion and your purpose can lead you. And that is how you win the game of life. Because you want to see yourself to the finish line, whether it be in Toastmasters or in real life. Conference chair. <laughs> Contestant, Louisa Davis, Mr. Darcy. Mr. Darcy, Louisa Davis. He won me over with a red rose. Actually, it was an electronic rose. We were on plenty of fish. Plenty of Fish is a dating site, and I've been single for a few months. And I thought, I'm not having a lot of success with the men in Vancouver. My parents live in Duncan. Why don't I try some island men? So I opened up my criteria 
And there was an email coming in from Mr. Darcy. Pretty good name, pretty romantic, and he attached an electronic rose. The only problem was his message. The message says, I want to woo you. And I thought, pretty romantic, but he spelled woo, W-O-U, and he spelled you, Y U. So I was thinking, usually my criteria is that they need to be able to have good spelling, but it's an island man. Maybe I need to give him a little a little opportunity to you know, and just go on, go forward with it. We set up a coffee date. I got there 15 minutes early, figuring I'll get the lazy lens, I'll get the coffee, then we don't have to deal with the who pays issue. Always a problem. And I sat down and waited five minutes, ten minutes. Fifteen minutes later, a van pulled up and scorched to a halt, and the man got out, dressed head to toe in painter's overalls. It looked like he'd been working. And he came in, and he made a grunt at me, and he kept walking. And I thought, oh, well, maybe that's not Mr. Darcy. And then he came back about five minutes later with a full, full lunch buffet, and he sat down in front of me, and then at that point I noticed that he still had the plaster on his arm from the construction work that he'd been doing earlier that day, and he sat and ate the sandwich in front of me, dripping the plaster into his sandwich. <laughs> and I thought, okay, this isn't working, but let's give him a chance. So tell me a little bit about yourself. He, he says to me, hey, do you like snakes? You know, snakes are my biggest fear. And he took out his cell phone and he went, do you like my pet snake? And he put it right in my face. And I said, and no, I'm not too good with snakes. Um, you know, I'm afraid of them. And he's like, oh, I'm afraid of needles. Type 1 diabetic, four needles a day for 30 years. This is even going to work. But, you know, I'm already here. I may as well make the most of it, right? So I decided that I'd ask him a couple questions. I see that you just pulled up in a van that says painting supplies, and did you just come from work? Pretty logical question. No, I just came from my AA meeting. <laughs> what? Oh, well, that's really good that you're taking care of yourself and you're following through on a commitment. Yeah, I kind of have to. You have to? Oh, yeah, because my boss said I needed to do this, otherwise I'd lose my job. Oh, okay. Do you like gambling? Uh, I like casinos. I don't know so much about gambling. And then he launched into a whole story about how he had a gambling addiction and that he was no longer living in his mother's place and he lost all his money and then his girlfriend, previous girlfriend, had kicked him out. Like this whole story, like, seriously, this is a first date? Really? <laughs> So I thought, well, I'll just change the topic. So we'll talk about something else. This has got, I want to finish my tea. May as well. At this point, he turns to me and he says, so, so what about you? I tell him a little bit about Toastmasters. I tell him about how I live in Vancouver, et cetera, et cetera. And we're starting to build up a little bit of rapport, if you can even say that. And at one point, I said to him, so do you like to travel? And he says, uh, did you go to the States recently? You know, I figure that's a nice, neutral, able topic, like conversation topic, right? And he says, oh, no, I can't. And I said, really? And I'm thinking, okay, there's got to be something here. He says, yeah, I'm on probation. <laughs> <laughs> True story, this actually did happen to me. And I said, oh, and I'm thinking, well, I may as well go for it. He's sitting and he's being so vulnerable and open. And his last one, what are you on probation for? And he says, I robbed a bank. <laughs> and I said, you robbed a bank? Why did you rob a bank? And he says to me, well, I was, I was homeless and drug addicted, and I really needed treatment. And I thought the best way to do that was to go into prison so that I could get the drug addiction and treatment that I needed. So I, I went in, I robbed the bank, and then I came out and sat in the alley and waited for the policeman to pick me up. 
<laughs> At this point, I'm like, okay, is this guy serious or is this like a joke? You know, where's the camera, Alan Funt, right? <laughs> and then he says, so when can we meet up again? <laughs> um, yeah, not not likely. I don't think this is going to work. But I was too polite. I was too nice. I just wanted to finish what I, what we were doing and then get in my car and drive off. And at that point, he says to me, you know, yeah, can I have another date? And I thought, well, you know what? Somewhere, sometime, someone else is going to be out there that matches you. Everybody's got matching baggage somewhere, but our baggage doesn't match. And I thanked him, I left the, the, the coffee shop and went on my way. And then afterwards I thought, you know, after all of this, it was a really fun experience because you get out of these meetings like that and you think, there's a, t there's a speech in this. This <laughs> 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 is fantastic material. <laughs> and at the end of it all, I thought, you know what, I should go with my gut. You can judge a book by its cover, but never judge an internet profile. Always judge an internet profile by its spelling. <laughs> <laughs> It goes to the use of the salutation. Yep. Is, does that go to assurance? Like, is that if it gets missed, is that sort of kind of a uh, thing that relates to assurance? What do you think? I think it does. Okay, so then you would use that. Yes. By the way, to that point, Mike Rafferty has got a uh, got a question out on uh, the District 21 Facebook site. There's a question specifically about that, so I chose to exclude it to see if it affected it. Because I voted that it does, but it, the majority of people said it doesn't, and some people said that uh, by putting it in, it actually negatively impacts it. It actually doesn't say anything in the criteria. And a lot of pre presenters uh, at contest level will start their story and then like a minute in will acknowledge the contest chair. That's the most important thing is to acknowledge the contest chair, because the contest chair is instructed to stand until they're acknowledged. And I have stood through an entire speech. So it gets to let the contest chair know, even if you don't acknowledge the audience, but as a speaker to acknowledge the chair. And I was told you don't start your speech until the contest chair sits. Mm -hmm. Well, there is so, a wow. uh, contest chair doesn't sit until they're acknowledged. Okay. They're, it's done. Is it for every contest or just international? Oh. Contest. Okay. Good yes. to know. It doesn't happen, but it's a protocol. Yeah. Contest chair sits once they're acknowledged. Yeah. Well, something to write up. Okay, so um, what did you think? Let's debrief. Does everybody have it in their ballot? Okay, let's debrief. So we're all judges, we've all gathered now, they're out counting ballots. We'll actually get Sean to count the ballots. Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> well, you're not. I don't care, you can win. Doesn't okay. matter who wins, you're okay, all going to get the same prize. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. You get an orange. Now you get to clean up the room. Okay, so let's have a look at, let's pull out your criteria and look at the criteria for the International Speech Contest. So we would we would do this as part of the debriefing. So who out of, so when you look at content, did anybody give, um, so what were your scores like in, um, well, let's see how we do this. We won't, what they do is not talk about scores. They talk about general impressions. How would, what were your general impressions? And of course, first of all, our, our, our contestants are okay with hearing this, right? Yeah. Sure. So just to be really clear with you as judges. So what was your sense in terms of speech development generally? Did you feel that the speech development was strong? Overall, or that was an area of great improvement to happen, or what? I hope they were all strong. Okay, you felt the construction, uh, speech development was all strong? Yeah. Okay, other viewpoints? It was okay. I thought it was okay. I think it was great. I thought introductions to the public were probably across the board. 
Okay, introductions needed in reading all the way through. Okay. And I feel like supporting materials for the main points made in EJ2 as well. Supporting um, points uh, maybe weren't the strongest. Okay. Other, yes. So this speaker, the three people decide the the one is it more logical, why the time say why the not a yeah, so it's different purposes, right, that were obvious in the speeches, which was just happenstance, but it was brilliant because they were very, one was more instructional, insightful, one was story, humor, one was, yeah, so, so different purposes, right, and, and different approaches, you could see the personalities. Okay, anything else in terms of development? Yes, they all had conclusions, maybe short. Okay, so they had conclusions. Okay. One, generally speaking, I felt, again, my year for transitions, I felt that transitions uh, could have been stronger, could have been used to set me up for the next phase and take me into that if I was working with the generally speaking. And, and so that I knew that it wasn't just, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. Right? And the other thing that happens in your speech development, your effectiveness and your speech value, going down into the delivery, because we're going to talk about delivery. One of the things about delivery is to get the audience right inside your story. So this happened with uh, all our presenters. They told a story out here, and they told it to us in third person. And what if you created the scenario where we all went into that into that environment? And so, uh, for example, when Jennifer was sharing with her um, about her dad, rather than my dad said, what about, come on, Jennifer, are we going to cut through the traffic or are we going to... And, and so you bring us into the dialogue, so we're now standing inside of the experience, right? Which would change the delivery for me. The same as um, Louisa in talking about Darcy, um, say, just, uh, you might say something like in the delivery, just imagine for a moment that you're standing there listening to this conversation. And I say to Darcy, Mr. Darcy. Hey, have you been to the States lately? He looks at me and says, oh, not on parole or something like that. Like you can bring the dialogue that now makes it feel like we're in the experience. So I start to get the delivery or of the impact of that delivery rather than hearing it 30%. Okay, make sense? Mm -hmm. So always look at where could it be a world champion level and say what's the gap and then talk to that in your judging. Okay? Look at what's the standard you have, what's the greatest level that you need. And dialogue in the in delivery is one of those main points where you want to be right in the middle. What about what about the delivery? What struck you of generally speaking as judges for delivery? What what worked? What didn't work? Um, yeah. One of the things I noticed, uh, just going by the criteria, is that they all didn't use the stage very well. There's all sorts of movement that didn't make sense. Yeah. yeah so not uh, yeah, and they and they all knew today or yesterday there was delivery speeches in all fairness, right? But yeah, and, and so they were all on the same place, but in purposeful movement and hand gestures and delivery, right? Yeah, okay. using the space. On that, yeah. <laughs> like the I kept getting nervous that she was going to trip on the court, and I oh. kept getting very distracted. Like, and I felt like, and I didn't know if Sean didn't move around too much because of the court, and I didn't, like, I, so honestly, I mean, that's, so I couldn't really yeah. give them too, like I couldn't be too critical because of the court. <laughs> and well, I know that that wouldn't happen in a real speech context. But it right? would. It could because yeah. something falls and you spend your whole time worried about if they're gonna, how they're gonna manage that, right? Yeah. So that's a reality of what what occurs as a judge yeah. and how the contestants handle things. 
Yeah. And it's probably just my ankle too. I then I could just see thought. I could see her shoes like a couple of times she got so close and mm -hmm. I was so scared because she had the higher heels on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's just a point that as as a human brain we go to uh oh, uh oh, yeah. what's gonna happen? And we're distracted. We yeah. get distracted from the speech. Yeah, yeah. yeah. April. I really liked uh, Louise's speech at Five Old Kids and Say Whatever. Yeah, right. And but I think um, for Louise, I just I loved your story. You really had me on the edge the whole thing was growing. But you know, I would say it would be so cool if you added in us actually seeing him sitting next to you. Because it became a story that the development could be I'm actually there in the room, just how you were actually showing. Yeah, like yeah. I, like use the senses. <laughs> Do you realize that as a speaker, uh, when you talk to your audience, the sense of smell is the strongest. Mm -hmm. And then I want to picture him when he walks in. If he's in paint or white, I want to know if he's got a hat on sideways. I want to know if he's got a mustache. I want to know that he's got a grin with a tooth missing. I want to know what this guy looks like because I want to sit there with Louisa. Right? That, that's the goal is to get us as the audience sitting there. And so that's something that I look for in delivery but also in, in development of the topic. Right? Okay. So it's looking at where every piece starts and where it ends. Where does another piece start and where does it end? And how is it all carried and how does it fit in? So Sean used the birth of Max, then he used the analogy or he used the acronym Max, which tied in nicely. And then he had then he came back to and I'm into Max. But he also started with having a boss. So there was a number of different arches in in uh, Sean's presentation that I heard, because he started with that boss. But he didn't leave it. He kept it got inserted, and then he ended up with back to the bosses again. Mm -hmm. So look for those kind of completions, right? And they have to make sense. They have to tie in somewhere also when you're looking at development. Okay. What else as, as um, judges did you hear in terms of delivery? Yes, Adrian. I thought, well, I'll just mention a few things here. Sure. Um, Sean's speech in the game was a bit quiet. We put him in the back. His voice was projected. His job for you to hear him. <laughs> no, you don't need to make excuses. <laughs> both Sean and Jennifer's speeches seemed like performance or presentations, while Louisa's seemed more conversational. I don't know how that is the way that they're delivered. They sound like they're being delivered, uh, Sean's and Jennifer's. Okay. And it, I wouldn't say it loses authenticity, but it seems like, I feel like I'm watching a performance rather yes. than I find, I, I don't know how to capture like, what that is that's there that yeah. resonates. Because they're authentic. Yeah, but there's something about like it's a presentation yeah. rather than I feel like I'm being talked to, I feel like I'm being talked at. Yeah, and I don't so, know how to, like, one, is, I'm trying to learn as a speaker, so, but also, it's something I pick up on, and it makes me feel distant from it, because I don't need to talk back. Okay, so look at, in terms of the listener, or the judge, look at the language that was used, and the speech development, because the, um, the way that Speeches can be written down, or speeches can be spoken down, and it's all in the language. So I could have written all of this down, and if it sounds conversational and I pretend and it sounds like we're having coffee at a coffee shop and having a conversation, it's usually in the language we use. So when we write things, we write more formally, and even the structure is more formal. So it's letting go of it. It's often the formality of the words that make it feel like it's a performance. How do you judge that? How do you judge it? Well, I didn't judge that very well in hindsight, thinking about it. Because yeah, you're looking at it, right? And I was looking Which at the great. criteria, I thought. They did well within the criteria. I didn't know where that fits in there. Where does that fit in? 
So it may be the manner, it may be affected of the way you respond, of, of how you connect with the audience, it might be the, um, the speech value, it might impact your, the act of speaking, that justifies the act of speaking, I don't know. I would like to say that, like, I, because I got distracted a few times, and in each of the speeches I got a little bit distracted in, in all of them, but sometimes some of the, there was too many words or something in some of them, or, like, um, I can't even remember, I know Sean had three points, but and I know that it all went with Max, but I can't remember what the three points were. You know, so I know that those things kind of distract, which causes me to... To lower the scores because I I can't even like effectively judge it because I miss stuff because of the distractions or or something or one one speech in particular there was too many thoughts too many ideas I was having a really hard time following and I was going to too many different places and um, so that's what I found yeah so you were looking for a reinforcement of the main messages so that it would stick with you so there was value. And so that's within the criteria, right? Yeah. So that's yeah. value, that's effectiveness, delivery on the purpose, right? So again, all of that stuff impacts in this criteria. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we could go on and discuss this, but it's just to illustrate how, as a judge, after talking all morning about all the criteria, and they all overlap, right? <laughs> so we've talked, and your listening's all clued in and tuned in to what all these things mean. And yet, when we listen to speakers, we go, what does that mean? What, what am I really looking for? And where, what category is that in? And what am I coming away with? Well, yeah, what's the value? What's the value of that? So is there, is there a life lesson with, with Sean in terms of seizing the moment, maximizing, whatever it is? Um, what's, what's the message from Jennifer, right, in terms of, her dad and what a model he was. That what's the message? What's the takeaway? What's the what's the message for Louisa? Should we not go on plenty of fish, or should we, or should we show up in pink whites, or, or check the spelling? <laughs> we'll judge by the spelling. Yeah. So all learn to spell. So first of all, let's give a round of applause to our team. <laughs> And I challenge you to really think about what is your, listen for great speeches. That's the best thing you can do to become a better judge, is hear the stuff that you absolutely love. Listen to great speeches. Listen to, um, there's, a, there's a book out there called Words That Shook the World, and they, there's speeches in there. Read well written speeches. Listen to good speakers, and so you get more of an idea of what you want to hear in a speech, and then look at it from the criteria. Get intimate with the criteria, because when we look at how you judged, I would suspect that they were all over the place. There was a lot of variation. But there was a lot of variation but in the judging was... out of three speakers. But there was one that stood out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Jennifer. Okay, so Jennifer won. <laughs> Jennifer got the most votes, or the most ballots. But think of the items that you considered and how you considered them to decide that, and how close or how difficult it was, and how short the time is when you're judging. Two things so, are interesting. Yeah, go oh, ahead. Yeah. Just how one factor can take you from first to first to last. Like I, I, I and yes. Yeah. Oh, that's and, all it takes. And yeah. also, when Jennifer was speaking, I had I did the plus minus thing, and I thought, why the heck does she have green or orange scissors in her back pocket for? And that's distracting. So at first it was negative, then I, oh. It's a, it's a <laughs> in the it's the speech at the moment, right? It's the speech at the moment. Okay, so um, 
I hope that it's helped to see the complexity of judging, the opportunity to challenge our own biases, to figure out what we really love, and whether we love the smell of pizza or not. <laughs> thank you for your time and your involvement, and thank you for stepping up as judges in the future for our district, our divisions, and our areas, and for taking the awareness back to your clubs, the importance of getting other visitors into your club to judge. Okay? And have fun judging.